windows in between us New moon in the house of Venus One stranger who sees you and reads your features Knows that your alibi might be tight But it's not quite leak-proof So if you're sitting at the light And you're crying in your car Just know that I see you And it's a 50-50 that I'm bloodshot, gun-shy Once bitten, twice tried Ribs pride wide to the sky till I'm see-through That's you In case you don't recognize yourself Well, do it luck! Everyday grief like I do I try but I do I'm twice bitten too My mind split in two My knuckles bright white From the ten to the two And the song in my head Is the theme for a fugue A state of decay Through the filter of corporate news Where they edit the grays and the blues They whitewash the brown Till they drown out the natural hues And then it's just another fact to refuse That the corporate ladders For hanging the company noose Consider it one of your perks After all it's communal in use so you can come and hang till your legs go limp and they're shaking you loose. Now you watch five co-workers opt for the alternate exit neatly suspended above where you wolf down your food. And your company gets its incentives embellished by harping on wellness, suggesting you'd best take time for your mental health after your 14 hours are through. Like we gave you a bottle to piss in and fixed up a noose on the cross beam. Christ, what more can we do? So if you struggle to breathe any moment that you aren't asleep, then remember, most of Americans fear for their savings, fear for their shelter, fear for their babies. You aren't the fringe of exception, but rather a perfect example of capital's rule. And you're far less alone than the ruling class tells you is true. You're far less alone than the ruling class tells you is true. The cast on strike. The studio stock starts taking a dive. The contract's tossed and they're gone with the tide. And the heads and execs their hands are tied. We can't pump this track and treat you, right? But what do you expect from the industry type who survive by the leeching of bodies and minds? From those who original thoughts never seem to find. So they're gonna reboot ALF before your wages arise. And it gives cause to pause and reflect on the times. If they're losing control of their fools and their mimes, when all those obedient actors who grew their careers by averting their eyes are now holding the line, along with the authors of countless scripts that strengthen the hand of that corporate grip, squeezing our throats till we take the pen and we accept and consent to the corporate drip, till you're all up to date on your pharma du jour, till you got a healthy support for the war on your lips, and now you know that the advertisers need more than a rerun summer full of flashback clips. Enter the scans from the year before, all the days of de-aging and mapping the face, and the hours of actors recording their voices are links in the chains that will bind them in place. 
Now all of those shows are so easy to make. When they got a drone they control that needs no break, it can bend, it can break, and it's cheaply replaced enough up to date films all in one take. And those studios bank on us doing our duty, unhinging our jaws and digesting the fakes. Cause they know that we'll love how synthetic it tastes. Watch as they edit your features without any trace. Not that there's anything you could do anyway. Now watch as they show you a movie you you say and shit you would never say. Dystopia boldly accelerates. Maybe you're only a mold, something to fill with a clone, something that Elon would celebrate. Something they own, something they program and code, something that's woefully able to know it's exanimate. Cause it doesn't feel touch over top of the laminate. You will not feel an emotion, but they will not scan and examine it. You and the other consumer contaminants fed on the federal diet of Kiev, Havana, and Tiananmen. I can't be the only one weighing the pros of abandonment. I can't be the only one weighing the pros of abandonment. Where did you think we'd go? Love, there's nowhere to lie. Guess it's not who you know, more it's what you can hide. Like we're chained to the floor, they're streaming us live while we're watching the war, counting backwards from five. Counting backwards from five Counting backwards from five Counting backwards have just an off-the-cuff chat between you and me, us. You want to talk? right down to earth in a language that everybody here can easily understand. Who are these people? It's, it's us. We're these people. I love um, that intro. <laughs> I love that intro so much. I'm here with uh, a different co-host this time, Oz LaFave. Hey guys, mm. thanks so much for having me on. Friend of the show, DJ Joe Nice. How are you, friend? What's good? And you hear Nick say this all the time. The United States is the most propagandized country in the world. We are so fucked, you guys. Again, I'm sorry for being cynical, but seriously, no. we're fucked. We are right. fucked. We are well and truly fucking fucked. I just appreciate all the work that um, you do and the platforms that you all are providing. Hey, you. Doing good. How are you guys doing? And as an independent media, we have a responsibility um, to be, you know, we don't hide our bias, obviously, but we must stay true to the facts. What's up, Cheers and salutations. Smoke them nice. if you got them. But I am here with a man that I've been waiting to talk to uh, for the last couple of years, uh, Nico House. Uh, as an educator, what I would suggest is that, first of all, podcasts like these are made. So you need to be an example for the people and for the future, knowing that your words can actually change the future. What What do you feel? What would Kwame Ture feel we would have to do? For politics is every day of the every minute. You have to be aware of what's going on. Not voting on one day, so the vote has never meant anything. So I'm not a Democrat. See, I would call that guy the Black Obama. <laughs> no. You know, the issues that we talk about, listen to us. As always, kids, labels are bad. They independent. Good night, fam. I didn't end news. What's up, everybody? It's another episode, another week. I'm here with my co-host, as always, Carlos Radek Carter. How are you, K-Bert? Good. Okay. How are you? Tired. Uh, I did work out today because I go, boy, I did it. I picked up heavy things and put them back down again. That's what you do. But anyway, uh, it's well, Wednesday. It is Wednesday, my dudes. Yeah. I was gonna ask you what exercises you did today. Uh, military Paris deadlift, and I gotta do some rows later. But yeah, back day. You didn't. So you didn't finish your workout then? Not quite. Not quite. It got oh. dark. 
Um, oh. and I, I have stuff inside to do both. Okay. But, I did the two big ones. So, you know, <laughs> I got PR to work for next week. We're, we're doing great. Great things. So, anyway, we brought, we brought stories. We did it. Yeah. Yeah. So, Monday was tax day. So, hopefully, everyone did their taxes. Yeah. Uh, did you do your taxes? No, no, they don't need. They don't. I, I don't got money to give. They'll be okay. You know, so we'll be fine. The last four um, later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hopefully the they don't penalize you for asking later. One of the perks <laughs> of not having income. You know. Well, um, that's. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um. So yeah, uh, but hopefully for everyone else, hope you got your taxes done. Um, but you might be wondering where does your tax money go towards? I mean, we, I think we'll mainstream media talks about this every once in a while, especially during election season. Well, mm-hmm. as the thumbnail indicates, we're going to be, well, we're going to be reporting about where your taxes are going towards, and more specifically, war. Well, more specifically, how much of your tax dollars goes towards war and more, especially if the war is in Ukraine and Gaza right now. So we're going to take a dive into that. Um, and then later on tonight, uh, this is probably the top story that uh, popped up over the weekend. Um, so Iran decided to handle business and mm-hmm. actually... Uh, perform their own attack against Israel in the aftermath of Israel bombing the Ukrainian, 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 Iran, what country? <laughs> <laughs> Iranian okay. embassy. There we go. I say every other country but Iran. So, yes. <laughs> yep. um, so that happened over the weekend. Hopefully YouTube doesn't ding us. Completely um, unprovoked attack, wink, wink. Completely unprovoked, right. wink, e, right. E. You know what I'm <laughs> so hopefully YouTube does not give us the boot for talking about this. So I will try and be as careful as possible to give a balanced view on this, but at the same time saying... Yeah the right word so YouTube doesn't stop the stream completely. So hopefully yeah. they don't. Um, but I think we, I have some articles. Yes. So so hopefully we will look at a couple of articles and then actually a subset article uh, that I found mm. um, yesterday um, that uh, might give some more insight into the goings on over in the Middle East. Um, so that's what I got. Okay. What do you have? Well, I have a couple of stories tonight. Uh, let's go here, uh, we're going to talk about the the BS assurances that uh, U.S. gave UK over Assange and what's going on with that case. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, one of the longer stories I. We're gonna talk about some Neuralink volunteers. Shout out to Jesse Chat for for the, the lyric. Um, we're gonna we're gonna go into how brain chips may be affecting war and the terrifying things that that might entail. So, and then I got some stuff on Space Wars. So everyone's favorite Lucasfilm Space Wars. So that's an so that's an extra story. Is there? All right. Yep. You ready to get started? Yeah, I'm since ready. we have a long stream, we might as well get started. Yep. Um, <laughs> first of all, why is there a blank page? What is this blank page doing? What is that blank page doing? There we go. Weird. Uh, you could use this QR code to send us a super chat. It's very easy since YouTube won't let us do it their way. We have our own way. So, code.com slash news network. Gonna leave a, leave a super chat, or you can hit exclamation mark donate 
in the live chat. If you get the link to that. Search them up on screen. If you send us some, some monies. We appreciate the monies. Um, but yeah. And look at all the people who've already given us some monies. Aren't you, aren't you nice? Look at all of you down there. And look, here's some other ways you can give us some monies. Patreon.com plus GDP Network. You can go on Substack, you can go over to Rumble and Rockfin and Cash App. Cash App. Um, you know, but yeah. You ready for the first one? Yep. Cool. Um, <clears throat> so, wait a second. All right. So, as we said, as I said earlier, um, Monday was tax day. So, hopefully, mm. all of you paid your taxes. Um, but you might be wondering how much of your money. Or how much of your taxes actually go go towards the things um, that I would think you would actually want your taxes to go to. Um, yeah. So we're going to take a look at that a little bit later, uh, giving some numbers um, to give us some context. But obviously, as you probably guess, we spend a good chunk of our your tax dollars go towards war. Uh, especially the wars in Ukraine and Gaza right now. Um, so what we're going to do first is we're actually going to listen to, didn't even know Al Jazeera had a podcast, but they have the podcast called The Take, uh, who is hosted by, I guess her name is Natasha Del Toro. We're not mm. going to listen to the whole thing, but this will kind of give a little, our toes wet into the money that your money is going to towards the military. And we're going to get break it down a little bit more in terms of numbers as far as how much of your money is going towards war versus other things. And as, as so, Tupac put it, you got money for war, but no money mm -hmm. for the war, something like that. Something like, yep. Okay. Um, cool. so, so this is just a, uh, an audio podcast and we're not going to listen to oh. all of it um but again this is natasha giving a little some insight into how much of your money is actually going towards war so okay off you go monday is the annual deadline for many u.s residents to pay their taxes do your own taxes online with h and r block and tax season will feel just as good as all those other seasons it's tax like holiday season. It's the oh, maximum God. refund. In the U.S., taxpayers are responsible for submitting their own tax bills to the government. Those taxes can fund things like national parks and health care, but they also go to the U.S. war machine in amounts that are making some taxpayers angrier this year in particular. How the hell do we practice war tax resistance? Help me. I don't want to go to jail. Girl, we just don't pay it. We being defiant, we being disobedient. And what we ain't going to do is for a genocide in 2023. Adding up where those tax dollars go are people like Lindsay Koshgarian. I am the program director at the National Priorities Project at the Institute for Policy Studies, and I'm in Northampton, Massachusetts. Hi, Lindsay. I'm so glad you're, you're here with us today. We know that taxes are due on Monday, April 15th. And as we watch the U.S. give billions to fund wars in Ukraine and Gaza, we can see some of how much of that hard-earned money Americans are giving to these war efforts. $75 billion. That's about how much aid the U.S. has committed to Ukraine since the beginning of Russia's bloody full-scale invasion. The U.S. provides about $3.8 billion dollars in aid to Israel every year. And since World War II, the U.S. has provided more foreign aid to Israel than any other country. What do we know about how much the U.S. war machine costs? Yes, so as you said, the, the U.S. war machine is enormous. Um, the military budget in the U.S. is pushing close to a trillion dollars these days. But it's really hard for most people to wrap their heads around numbers like that. What is a trillion even? So every year we do a tax receipt that shows people where their income tax dollars are going. And what we found this year is that the average taxpayer is contributing more than $2,900 
to the Pentagon, and more than half of that, or over $1,700, is going specifically to the Pentagon's corporate contractors. So that's more than the average monthly rent in the United States. Wow. All war efforts put together, we would calculate all of the U.S.'s militarism, both abroad and domestically, so including incarceration, including deportations, including all of those things, if you total all of that up, it comes to over $5,000 per taxpayer. Oh, my gosh. Those numbers are are really staggering. Um, and how do they compare what to money that? for other pro- 5000 per taxpayer? Yep. <clears throat> okay. That's how much each of you individually is spending on war. On average, yes. On average. So some of you might be spending more than that. Um, you know, one. Programs then. I mean, how would you break down the rest of where one tax dollar goes? Yes. So the U.S. is number one in military spending. We are number one in selling weapons around the world. We are not number one in almost any of the categories where you would want us to see us come in number one. We're not number one in terms of lifespan. We're not number one in terms of health outcomes. We're not number one in terms of child poverty. So, for example, the child tax credit, which in the U.S. was expanded over the last few years during the pandemic and was responsible for cutting child poverty in this country almost in half. The average taxpayer for the child tax credit was contributing just $110. So the average taxpayer is giving more than 10 times as much for Pentagon contractors as they were for this program that cut child poverty in half. How much more does the U.S. spend when it comes to military spending? I know it sort of outranks, you know, many other countries. Yeah, so the U.S. outspends the next 10 countries combined. So there is a huge gap between U.S. military spending and the next countries. And many of those next countries are actually considered U.S. allies. So it's really just driven by the U.S. policy desire to have the largest and most powerful military and have complete military dominance all over the world. So we're outspending the next 10 countries. And that's because we have things like 750 military installations around the world. Wow. And of course, you know, it's one thing to have bases around the perimeter of the United States, but there is no defensive reason for having 750 military installations in dozens of countries. And it's this military sprawl that drives this enormous budget. And of course, we're also the number one weapons seller to the world. So by far, the U.S. sells more weapons to militaries around the world than any other country. If Americans knew how much money they were putting towards, you know, militarism, uh, what, do you, what do you think the response would be? Well, that's why we want people to know how much money they're putting towards militarism, because we know what their feelings about it are. Right now, a strong majority of Americans, more than half, want to see an immediate ceasefire and cease to military operations in Gaza uh, and support an immediate ceasefire. According to a new survey, only 32% Americans say the U.S. should support Israel militarily. 68% say there should be a ceasefire. Obviously, our tax dollars are going towards those things. So it's a significant investment that people are making. And really, right now, it's driven by military aid to Ukraine and Israel. And we know that people are opposed to those military operations. So we can only expect that they would be opposed to their tax dollars going toward those wars. How opposed are they? A growing number of people want to withhold part of their taxes. That's after the break. So, uh, I will link that podcast. I should have done that. Uh, If you want to finish, listen to the rest of it. It's about another seven minutes uh, of that episode. Uh, We'll put it in the chat. Um, And then we'll put it in the link description if you, anyone who's watching after this. Um, So let's get into more details regarding your tax money. So Jake Johnson from Tommy Green. What? 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 Receipts! 
true timeline screenshots in everything uh, where's that mm. from i wish i knew <laughs> some clip from some like show i don't know i found it and thought we could use it so okay yeah. <laughs> okay so jake reports uh Average U.S. taxpayer contributed more to militarism than Medicare in 2023 report. This year, $5,109 of the average American's taxpayer dollars went to fund the military and its support systems, said a call offer of a new analysis. The average U.S. taxpayer was forced to contribute more, more to militarized programs than to Medicare, and Medicaid combined in 2023, according to a new analysis released Tuesday by the National Priorities Project. Published ahead of Tax Day, the analyst sheds light on the extent to which the federal income tax dollars of ordinary Americans are fueling militarism and its support systems, such as the Pentagon, which currently accounts for roughly half of the federal government's total discretionary budget. Overall, in 2023, the average taxpayer contributed $5,109 for militarism and support systems, including war and the Pentagon, veterans programs, deportations, and border militarization, and federal spending on policing and prisons, according to MPP, which is a project of the Institute for Policy Studies. By comparison, the typical U.S. taxpayer contributed $4,308 to Medicare and Medicaid, $346 $346 to K-12 through education, $516 to nutrition assistance for low-income Americans, and $58 to diplomacy-related programs. Right now, millions of Americans are struggling to stay afloat. It's becoming so expensive to live, eat, and have a home. Yet, instead of addressing the cost of living crisis or funding measures to address our community's needs, this year, $5,109 of the average American's taxpayer dollars went to fund the military and its support system. Celia Gusero, MPP's outreach coordinator and an author of the new analysis. A far greater portion of our tax dollars go towards militarism at home and abroad and towards harming and separating immigrant families when we should be investing instead in safe and healthy conditions for our communities and our futures, Gusereros added. Last year, according to MPP, $1,748 of the average American's income tax contributions went to the pockets of Pentagon contractors such as Lockheed Martin and Boeing, which lobbied Congress aggressively for an even larger military budget, much of which ends up in private hands. Lindsay Koshargan, MPP's program director, who we heard earlier in the podcast, said yeah. Tuesday that it's outrageous that the average taxpayer is given the equivalent of a month's rent to Pentagon contractors. Yeah, more than a month's rent. Right? More than a month, yeah, for some. Yeah. Um, these big corporations are already not paying their fair share in taxes, said Koshargan. Instead, ordinary people are subsidizing those corporations' profits and million-dollar CEOs' pay packages. Taxpayer dollars should be going to real needs like schools, food and housing programs, or renewable energy, not lying the pockets of corporations. The analysis comes weeks after President Joe Biden signed into law an $825 billion military spending package for fiscal year 2024 that includes... $33.5 billion to build eight ships and allocates funds for 86 F-35 and 40, 24 F-15 EX fighter jets, as well as 15 KC-46A tankers, Defense mm-hmm. News reported. Yeah. Like Last month, Elon's kid's Biden name. Re- What's that? Um, Elon's kid's name. <laughs> oh. Delta AEX. 12, 23, Pi, Delta, um, whatever that kid's name is. Um. <laughs> Last month, Biden released a budget proposal that called for $850 billion for the Pentagon and more than $1 trillion overrides funding, and we reported on that. Thank you, about three weeks ago, I think. Something like we that. We reported on this. Yep. 
Just like our personal expenses, our income tax payments can change the lives for the better or not, MPP said Tuesday. If we put more funds into education, we'll probably see kids and families better off. If we put more into Pentagon contracts, we'll see their CEOs and shareholders better off, and we'll see U.S. weapons used in conflicts around the world. Yeah. Actually, oh, let's take a look at this. You have to zoom in a little bit more because it's kind of... Uh, here, let's do, let's just do big press. Let's do that. There you go. All oh, right. it didn't, I in. can't zoom. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right. So we'll just go over a couple of these. Um, yeah. but the average U.S. peer contributed $4,308 for Medicare and Medicaid. Thanks to Medicare, nearly all Americans are older than insured. Thanks to expanded Medicaid enrollment and ACA subsidies, the number of uninsured Americans hit a record low in 2022. And I'm sure that's gone up since then. Versus $5,109 for militarism and its support systems, including the Pentagon and war, veterans programs, deportations, and border militarization, and federal spending on policing and prisons. So essentially, we spend more on military than we do on healthcare. Right. And not even everyone has health care. All right. So let's go to the next one. 346 for K for 8 education versus 2,974 for the Pentagon, more than half of which went to corporate contractors. The Pentagon budget is set to increase by $27 billion this year. Okay. 516 for food stamps. So, again, that's how much you're paying out of your taxes towards that on average mm -hmm. versus 1748 for Pentagon contractors. Those contractors pay their CEO multi-million dollar salaries at a taxpayer's expense, and their spending on dividends and stock buybacks to further enrich their shareholders rose 73%. So $110 for the child tax credit um, and there was some news on this that essentially it's being cut mm. um, versus $249 for Pentagon contracts for Lockheed Martin, the top Pentagon contractor and making of the troubled F-37 jet engine. $58 for diplomacy to end and prevent wars versus $112 to other militaries for weapons and training that feeds conflict and harm citizens. Mm. Just under $32 for substance use disorder support and mental health programs versus uh, $32.29 $32 for federal prisons. This only scratches the surface. State and local governments spend far more on prison costs. $23 for the FAA versus $78, $87, sorry, for Pentagon contracts for Boeing. $14 for wildfire management versus $110 to ICE and the CP, CBT, uh, the agencies responsible for separating immigrant families through detentions and deportations. Mm. Uh, just under $11 for energy efficiency and new, new renewable energy programs versus $12 for Pentagon and NASA contracts to SpaceX, Elon Musk's space travel company. Okay. And that's it. That's it. Okay. Cool. So just to give you an idea of how little we spend on actual things that will help us versus the military complex, essentially. The numbers don't lie, and they spell disaster for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Short uh, segment, but any thoughts? Well, no. I mean, I, I think it's it's good that we know. I mean, 5000 for military contract is great. You know? So, but, yeah, I mean... Going to, to Boeing, going to, to DARPA, going to all those things. Which we'll get into what those things might be paying for later in the show, for sure. Um, but yeah, 
Um, I mean, nothing, <coughs> nothing useful for us. So, you know, send these clips to all the people who complain about having to pay for their, you know, cousins like food stamps. You know what right. I mean? And the thing is, it's like people complain about student loan debt. That's just one thing that I know off the top of my head. That right. and you know, but look at how much we spend on education. Just on the, per, per on average, like three hundred dollars of your tax money is mm-hmm. going to education. So you know, so it's just kind of like I would personally would rather have more of my money education and especially if we were to eliminate some student loan debt for people that i'd rather have my money go towards that um and i think just to kind of get so i think actually this table is kind of good to kind of get that context for people of how much we're actually just giving a well the government is actually taking away from us in terms of what we where the bulk of our tax money goes to so Really, people shouldn't complain about, oh, like, my taxes go towards is trying to uh, alleviate student loan debt. Well, most of your money is going towards the military. Mm-hmm. Right? To give you some perspective of that. So, and a lot of your money isn't even going towards public education anyway. So, what's up? Yeah. So, you know, but it's ridiculous to kind of see that instead of giving this money towards things that actually will help people. I I think it's good to kind of see these numbers, though, just to kind of give that perspective and just giving the realization that, oh, shit, like, um, this is actually where our taxes are going towards, and it's not helpful uh, to us at all. It's helping Israel, though. (laughs) Yep. <laughs> in terms of the money that aren't money that is going towards them and to defend defend themselves, quote unquote, but nothing to help us. No. No. Help. God. That would that would be nice. They'll never they'll never help. Um and not anyway. even that, just fifty eight dollars for diplomacy. Fifty eight dollars on average. Yeah. So I it's mean, like we don't even care about <laughs> No. No, if no, we don't care no. about keeping peace, we want to bomb your ass. That's what we want to do. That's so no. just even looking at that, it's and and it's <laughs> pray pray they don't alter the deal further, you know? Like, right. Like that's like, the deal. It's right. It's literally not in our investment for peace. No. Literally not there. No. You know, our money is meant to well, for them to basically start war. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I mean, makes sense. So, anyway, speaking of money, you can you can give us some monies over at Kofi at co-v.com slash Indie News Network in the QR code on your screen or put exclamation mark donate in the chat and you can give us a little super chat that way. Isn't that nice? Money, please! Money, please. Um, and if you can't uh, help us monetarily, do these things like subscribe, sharing, commenting. Very easy stuff to do, you know? So please, sabarakarai, saraka, whatever. Whatever, you know. Um, but yeah, hit that, hit that subscribe button. We're, we're Actually, getting there. Me, Look at what we're at. I, yeah, I think we're too shy of 19. Too shy of 19. Two people. Get two people in here to subscribe. That's all you gotta do. You know? Make that number go up two tonight. I'll be happy. Um, yep. But anyway, too shy. cool. I'm gonna go check Rockfin and Rumble, uh, which I have linked for people in the chat if they would like to go there. <coughs> subscribe on Rumble. Subscribe on Rockfin. In case the YouTube overlords decide they don't like us, you can go there. Um, you know, look, there's people on on Rumble. Go start. This is so stupid. It hurts my brain. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It hurts your brain. Federal tax dollars are basically deleted upon receipt. Yep. So yeah. go start holding the Rumble down. And I know Animator is over on the rock, man. You know, uh, 
Uh, she says, fuck, dude, we are truly fucking fucked. I, I agree. As does, as the Missy, if I can find that quickly. Here we go. We're fucked. Yeah. Um, cool. So, our next story, we're going to talk about the assurances that the U.S. gave the U.K. recently. <coughs> As you can tell, they might involve some bull and the poop emoji. So, Keep that in mind as we read through these. You will find out what we mean by that. But anyway, um, so I brought Joe Loria from Consortium News, one of the one of the better uh, journalists that, that keeps up with Assange, as as there are many. But he writes U.S. issues assurances on Assange. So let's get into what he means. The United States Embassy on Tuesday filed two assurances with the British Foreign Office saying it would not seek the death penalty against imprisoned WikiLeaks publisher Julian Assange and would allow Assange the ability to raise and seek to reply upon at trial the rights and protections given under the First Amendment, according to the U.S. diplomatic note. Uh, this sentence, keep that in mind. We're going to go over that in a second. The so, ability to raise and seek to reply upon a trial. Upon a trial. Yes. What does that mean? I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish we knew. Um, so, Assange's wife, Stella Assange, said the note makes no undertaking to withdraw the prosecution's previous assertion that Julian has no First Amendment right because he is not a U.S. citizen. Instead, she said, the U.S. has limited itself to blatant weasel words claiming that Julian can seek to raise the First Amendment if extradited. You ever heard any legal stuff talking about seek to raise before? No, but that's why I'm... That, what, actually, I have to look this up. What does that mean? <laughs> Feel free. I mean, I, I think it's just bring it up. He can, just, he can mention it, right? He can mention free, the First Amendment. Like, it doesn't mean we take it into account, is what it sounds like. You can raise the, the effort, right? But <coughs> she continues, the note contains a hollow statement, namely that Assange can try to raise the First Amendment at trial and at sen sentencing. But the U.S. Department of Justice can't guarantee he would get those rights, which is precisely what it must do under British extradition law based on the European Convention on Human Rights. So, the U.S. Department of Justice is legally restricted to assure a free speech guarantee to Assange equivalent to Article 10 of the European Convention, which the British court is bound to follow, but without that assurance, Assange should be free, according to British Crown Prosecution Service comment on extradition. So, in USAID versus Alliance for Open Society, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 2020 that non-U.S. citizens outside the U.S don't possess constitutional rights. Both former CIA Director Mike Pompeo and Gordon Cromper, Assange's U.S. prosecutor, have said Assange does not have First Amendment rights. Because of the separation of powers in the United States, the executive branch's Justice Department can't guarantee to the British court what the U.S. judicial branch decides about the rights of a non-U.S. citizen in court, said Major Cohn, law professor and former president of the National Lawyers Guild. Let's assume that the Biden administration does give assurances that he would be able to raise the First Amendment and that the high court found that those were significant assurances, Cohn told Conservative News. That reality doesn't mean anything, because one of the things that the British courts don't understand is the U.S. doctrine of separation of power. <coughs> the prosecutors can give all the assurances they want, but the judiciary, another one of these branches of government in the U.S., doesn't have to abide by the executive branch's claim or assurance. Okay? I say that rules in favor of both of the assurances made. Myself, personal. Right? So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what the executive branch says. They can do whatever they fucking want in the courts. Right? Right. So, regardless of assurances. So, 
In other words, whether a son can rely on the First Amendment or not getting the death penalty in his defense in the U.S. court is up to that court, not Cromberg or the Department of Justice, which issued the assurance on Tuesday. The United States has issued a non-assurance in relation to the First Amendment. Right? So, Assange's legal team now has the right to challenge the credibility and validity of the U.S. assurances filed on Tuesday. The U.S. would then have a right to reply to Assange's legal submission to the court, which will hold a hearing on May 20th, you know, save that date, to determine whether or not to accept the U.S. assurances. If the court does, Assange can be put on a plane to the U.S. theoretically that day. If not, Assange would be granted a full appeal against the Home Office 2022 order to extradite him. Assange is wanted in the U.S. on 17 charges under the 1917 Espionage Act and one on conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. He faces up to 175 years in a U.S. dungeon. The diplomatic note does not does nothing to relieve our family's extreme distress about his future, his grim expectation of spending the rest of his life in isolation in U.S. prison for publishing award-winning journalism, Stella said. In its 66-page ruling on March 26, the two high court judges wrote, Kronberg wouldn't have said Assange would be without First Amendment rights to trial unless that was a tenable agreement that the prosecution was entitled to deploy with a real prospect of success. If such an argument were to succeed, it would, at least arguably, cause the applicant, Assange, prejudice on the grounds of his non-U.S. citizenship. Remember when we covered what they said they wouldn't allow extradition over, right? That, mm -hmm. remember, this is the stuff we were like, why are they bringing this part into this? About his, you know, as an Australian citizen, right? And this is it. So, um, you know, hints on the grounds of his nationality. Right? So, the applicant wishes to argue at any trial in the United States that his actions were protected by the First Amendment. He contends that if he is given First Amendment rights, the prosecution will be stopped. The First Amendment is therefore of central importance to his defense to the extradition trial. So, they're relying on First Amendment rights. So, again, we have U.S.'s filed assurances in Assange's extradition case, which were requested by a British court. Before it makes a final decision on his ability to appeal, next step is a hearing on May 20th. Warn what those assurances are about in our earlier story here. Stefania Marizzi, responding to Megan Spatia, with all due respect for Megan, I disagree with her tweet. While U.S. has submitted assurances that Assange won't face death penalty and discrimination, it has not provided any assurance that he will be protected by the First Amendment. Right? Very simple stuff. Right. So. And I also think, because of what Joe Loria brought up earlier, it doesn't matter either of the assurances. The courts can do what it wants. Yes. So, uh, you know, uh, both of these are bullshit, in my opinion. Um, but again, this raise and seek thing, did you, did you find out what that meant? Raise and no. seek stuff? Okay, I mm -hmm. think Joe Loria pretty much said that he can, like, bring it to the court. They're going to let him, you know, like, essentially raise it as an argument. Right. But it doesn't mean they listen to it. Right. You know, that's what it sounded like. So, <clears throat> an, ass a an assurance that Assange can raise, the First Amendment is completely meaningless. Anyone can raise anything in court. The U.S. reserves the right to argue that the First Amendment doesn't protect Assange and admits a U.S. judge could reach that conclusion. So that's that's where we're at. So you know, I think that they're going to uh, not accept these. I would imagine, since they asked specifically about that citizenship thing, which then means what? Assange sits in Belmarsh for longer, right? You know, hopefully till after the election is what I'm betting. <laughs> So we'll see. Um, but here's here's this bit. So a sentence of death will neither be sought nor imposed on Assange. The United States is able to provide such assurances as Assange is not charged with a death penalty eligible offense, and the United States assures that he will not be tried for a death eligible offense. Remember, 
doesn't matter what the executive says. Court can do what it wants. Right? I mean, am I am I missing something? You know, let me know. Yeah. Um so again, here's here's Stella, right? You know. Stella. She's she's talking about the seek to raise and the weasel words, you know. Diplomatic note does nothing to relieve our family's extreme distress about his future. Grim expectations of spending the rest of his life in isolation in U.S. prison for publishing award-winning journalism. The Biden administration must drop this dangerous prosecution before it is too late. Now, I did hear there's talks of him dropping it. I doubt that's accurate. Because, especially after the executive just sent this. Which means they are continuing this trial. So... You know, we have a lot of time before election season. If Biden wants an easy win to try to pull some Democrats over, that give a shit. But at this point, you know, I doubt it. Um, anything you want to add before I get into a little bit more? Well, I, I think, as you said, Biden, yeah, it's an elect- I They know, well... People are not talking about Assange as they should in mainstream media, but yeah, that doesn't mean that the administration is not aware of the significance of this. So, yeah, I think, as you said, Biden is just giving another carrot to kind of make it seem like, oh, you know, like to... Um, that he actually really cares when the reality is, I think, as he's as you said, he's basically trying to kick the da- can down the road. You mm-hmm. know, God forbid that Trump gets in power again, that he doesn't have to deal with it. So, yeah. but yeah, I, I've said this many times. This is just their way of having Assange rot yeah. indefinitely until, yeah. you know, so as they don't want to deal think- with the problem yesterday that he's the head on the spike in front of the castle pretty much you know so that's what it seems like essentially slow torture for everyone to see right uh yeah so caitlin johnstone one of our favorites here uh writes so they're really doing it the biden administration is really ignoring australia's request to end the case against Assange, and they're proceeding with their campaign to extradite a journalist for telling the truth about war crimes. In order to move the extradition case forward, per a British High Court ruling, U.S. prosecutors need to provide, quote, assurances that the U.S. would not seek the death penalty, would not deprive Assange of his human right to free speech because of his nationality. The U.S. provided the assurance against the death penalty, which they previously opposed doing, and for the free speech assurances, they said only that Assange will be able to raise and seeks to rely on U.S. First Amendment rights, adding a decision as the applicability of the First Amendment is exclusively within the purview of the U.S. court. Basically just saying, I mean, you're welcome to try to have free speech protection. They're just squeezing and squeezing this man as hard as they can, or as long as they can, get away with to keep him silent and make an example of him to show what happens when journalists reveal unauthorized information about the empire, just like Gaza? The persecution of Julian Assange makes a lie of everything the U.S. and its Western allies claim to stand for and reveals the cool face of tyranny beneath the mask of liberal democracy. Any questions? No. Nope. about right. All right. Um, Misty, U.S. again. Saying Assange can seek to rely upon the First Amendment as bunk. Assange can seek to rely upon a herd of goats in court if he wants. That's Kathleen <laughs> McClellan, right, of Whisper. Um, so, and maybe he should seek to rely on a fairy flying out of the judge's ass and granting his freedom. Better chance of that than a fair trial. Kangaroo, kangaroo court bullshit. Free Assange, right? So, I think that's just about everything I... Oh, meanwhile, Care Bear, the CIA director, William Burns, filed a state secrets privilege demand to withhold information in a lawsuit against the agency by four American journalists and attorneys who were spied on during their visits to Assange at the embassy in Ecuador. Ecuadorian embassy in London, sorry. 
State secrets privilege is a U.S. evidentiary rule designed to prevent courts from revealing state secrets during civil litigation. The CIA began the process of invoking it with the Assange lawsuit earlier this year. Here's what Burns argued, so pay attention. I am asserting the state secrets and statutory privileges in this case, as I have determined that either admitting or denying that CIA has information implicated by the remaining allegations in the amended complaint and response of response reasonably could be expected to cause serious and in some cases exceptionally grave damage to the national security of the United States. He's claiming it will break the security of the United States. That's what he's claiming. Um, I don't know how. After deliberation and personal consideration, I have determined that the complete factual basis for my privilege assertions cannot be set forth on the public record without confirming or denying whether CIA has information relating to this matter, and therefore risking the very harm to U.S. national security that I seek to protect, he says. So, what? Huh? Fuck you. Oh, fuck you, fuck you. Fuck you, fuck you. So, when did you put that on? Oh, uh, yes, Jamie, <laughs> Jamie Fox. May he rest in peace because we know that new one's a clone. Um, <laughs> 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 so, Caitlin Johnstone, which is obviously a load of horseshit, as the songs himself. Tweeted in 2017, overwhelming majority of information is classified to protect political security, not national security. Burns isn't worried about damaging the national security of the United States. He's worried about the potential political fallout from information about the CIA spying on American lawyers and journalists while visiting a journalist who's been actively targeted by the legal arm of the U.S. government. Political security is also why the U.S. is working to punish Julian Assange for publishing inconvenient facts about U.S. war crimes. The Pentagon already acknowledged years ago that the Chelsea Manning leaks for which Assange is being persecuted didn't get anyone killed and had no strategic impact on U.S. war efforts. But plainly, this isn't about national security. It's just politically damaging for the criminality of the U.S. government and the public. For all to see. Uh, sounds about right to me. Yep. So, but yeah, anything to add before we get out of this story? I mean, it, it's, as you said, it's all bullshit. And yeah. it, it's, it's just trying to make an end of the molehill of this situation. You can't. Like, they're trying to muddy the waters so much that it's just, you know, like, if you were to see me, I probably saw me if I had question marks all over my face. I think that's generally the idea of that, that anyone who cares about Assange is having right now. It's like, what the fuck are they doing? It's just, you know, I think it's just a way to, yeah, it, it's... All of this stuff, just to, because because they can't justify keeping him in Valmarsh. Yeah. So essentially, they're trying to pull out anything out their ass to give the justification why even he has to stay there, or maybe to our government's benefit to extradite him here to be tried. Yeah. So um, it, lost a lost adult in the check. Fun fact: the state secret plea was first used to cover up negligent maintenance on the image of a B-17 in 1953. So, that's, that's, they're running with that old trick. You know? Right. So, yay! It's, hey. it, yeah, it's just, it, it is bullshit. And, just free Assange. That's all, I, like, ultimately. Just, like, Wouldn't it be know. nice? I agree. Free Assange. Um, 
And saying these things is why we're demonetized, so you can always go to codeshv.com to support us. You know, go to code-v.com slash in news network or scan the QR code on your screen or put exclamation mark donate in chat and I will do that now um, make sure that works but yeah you should be able to do those things and if you can't support monetarily you can just support us by liking subscribing sharing commenting you know we're we're trying to get to 2k we're getting there you know Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Um, and I will go to Rock <coughs> and Rumble and check in on that before we get to our next story. Um, let's put in Rumble into our chats and we'll put in Rock Band into our chats. Which, if you haven't subscribed to either of our pages on there, please do. Um, Anna Mayers is having a mild Persian kitty emergency. Uh, bath time for Jack Jack. So, is she having bad time for kidney? So, I'm sure she will come back with scars. Um, because <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens when I do it. Um, but anyway, uh, go start over on the Rumble. U.S. position. I can't hear you. <laughs> um, you can't ask for free speech without, with no free speech, pretty much. Um, go start saying it's called a cover up. So, yeah. Couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, awful. Um, but anyway, you ready for our next one? I'm ready. Yeah. So, as I said earlier, I have to be very careful how I report on this. Um, hopefully YouTube doesn't um, shut this stream down. Uh, yeah. Hopefully. We'll see. Um, but, so, I'm going to be very careful of how I hopefully, um, say things here. But over the weekend, Iran um, made their stand against Israel in response to them bombing their consulate. Yeah. Um, Iran, to be very fair, what said to, to us in the U.S., you're going to say something about this? You're going to condemn... Um, Israel on this because the last we checked, that's a violation of international law, you know. And very possibly, yeah. And the U.S. was just like, "Nope, we ain't." Nope. So nope. Iran gave warning and said, "Okay, well, since you're not saying anything, we are going to." We're going to show you what we're capable of, and the and the sad thing, the the interesting thing is, Iran didn't give all they had; they mm. only gave a little bit. So, gotcha. but regardless, over the weekend, Iran did the business, and mm. I know a lot of people online were, I don't want to say celebrating, but you know, but people were like, well, you know, as the saying goes, you f around, you find out, you find out. There was so, a firefight. So, so, um, so we'll get into some details uh, regarding this. So, I will warn you: this will probably be a long segment. I'll try and keep it uh, not so long because you got two other stories that you're going to do tonight. Yeah. So One very um, long. So, but, um, oh, but, so we'll. We'll try and speed through it, and then we'll stop where need be. Yeah. Uh, again, from Common Dreams. Uh, actually, this will be the first of a couple of oracles I'm going to be pulling. Um, mm -hmm. Jessica Corbett um, reports Iran launches drone attack against Israel over consulate bombing. BB will use it as the pretext for another proclamation because he's bent on starting this war, one writer predicted. So Jessica writes... Iran on Saturday launched several drones and missiles toward Israel in retaliation for the nation's deadly bombing of the Iranian consulate in Syria early this month. God, Colin, I heard it was unprovoked. Isn't it unprovoked? Well, well so, well, I said <laughs> earlier, I just said it in the beginning of the yes. <laughs> Totally unprovoked, I heard. 
Right. Mm -hmm. So, so going to friend of, so according to friend of the show B, uh, she tweeted breaking Iran's IRGC confirms launch of dozens of drones and missiles towards occupied territories and Israeli positions. In response to numerous crimes of the Zionist regime, including the attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus and the martyrdom of a group of our military commanders and advisors in Syria, the Air Force of the R IRGC targeted specific positions inside the occupied territories by firing dozens of missiles and drones. Source, Press TV. Um, shout out to Vanessa Bealy, who's been over in Syria forever. And if you're listening, Vanessa, I'll take some of that steel they got in Damascus, the knife, anything. I'll take that shit. Very happy. You know, that's that good stuff. That Damascus. <laughs> um, so Jessica continues, the United States should avoid taking any military action in connection with the Israel-Iran conflict. Israeli and U.S. officials also confirmed the IRGC launch, estimated by Israel to involve over 100 drones. A short while ago, Iran launched unmanned aerial vehicles from its territory towards the territory of the state of Israel, the IDF said in a statement. The air defense array is on high alert at the same time as the Air Force planes and Navy ships are on a mission to protect the country's skies. The IDF is monitoring all targets, added the IDF, which had been ranging the war on the Gaza Strip since a Hamas-led attack on Israel October 7th. We ask the public to adhere to and follow the instructions of the Home Front Command and the official IDF announcements regarding the matter. Iran's drone launch comes after Iranian officials have reportedly sent a, been sending a message to the Biden administration through back channels. We will attack the forces that attack us, so don't fuck with us, and we won't fuck with you. Further fueling fears of a new regional war, U.S. President Joe Biden said Friday, we are devoted to the defense of Israel. We will support Israel. We will help defend Israel. So just more of the same shit that they you know the You long. know the thing. An American defense official said Saturday that U.S. forces in the region continue to shoot down Iranian-launched drones targeting Israel. Our forces remain postured to provide additional defensive support and to protect U.S. forces operating in the region. As the death toll in Gaza has mounted, the Israeli assault, which the International Court of Justice has determined is plausibly genocidal, and you've also, so, also you've not done shit. I mean, it's since. not quite boots on the ground, but they're essentially saying that the U.S. forces are now helping in the war effort, which, I mean, they already were, but now well, actively we shooting down. Well, we reported on this. We reported Iranian on this. Iranian equipment. We, yeah. Yeah. But we reported on this that Israeli troops are there, as well as other ally forces are allegedly. In Israel. Allegedly. Yeah. So, <laughs> God be careful in saying that. But yeah, I, I, um, I wish we knew what YouTube thought was disinformation in, in all of this. Since it took down a hard lens video and an entire stream from Nick at RDN. Love to know what that's about. You know, if we could have some details, please. But, you know, um, whatever. The Israeli assault, which the International Court of Justice has determined is plausibly genocidal, has killed at least 33,686 people. Biden has intense, faced intense pressure to, on, to condition or even cut off military aid to Israel. Yeah. In response to Iran's attack on Israel, Sarah Lee Whitson, executive director at Democracy for the Arab World Now, said in a statement that the United States should avoid taking any military action in connection with the Israeli-Iran conflict or further entangle U.S. armed forces in unauthorized and dangerous fighting in the Middle East. The Biden administration should call on Israel to immediately announce a ceasefire in Gaza and to refrain from using U.S. weapons in any further unlawful attacks against other countries' embassies and diplomatic facilities, she added. On top of the nearly $4 billion in military aid that the U.S. gives Israel annually, the Biden administration has been shipping arms to the IDF since October and pushing for a new package worth over $14 billion that requires congressional approval. U.S. House Majority Leader Skeev Scalise said Saturday that in light of Iran's unjustified attack on Israel, shut up, the House will move from its previously announced legislative schedule next week 
to instead consider legislation that supports our ally Israel and holds Iran and its terrorist proxies accountable. Late Saturday, U.S. Senate, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer released a statement commending the Israel and American troops who stopped most of the missiles and drones. We're actually going to talk about that in a few minutes uh, because there's a question of whether that is true. Condemning Iran's attack and saying that it is even clearer that the best way to help Israel is for the House to quickly pass the Senate bipartisan national security supplemental next week. Mm. Appearing on Al Jazeera Saturday, Sultan Barak, Barakat, a professor at Hamad bin Khalifa, Khalifa. University, suggested mm-hmm. that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu attacked the Iranian consulate to secure more U.S. weapons and try to silence anti-war critics. Um, so if you screw them in, uh, so this is a tweet from Franco Barsetic. Yeah. Barsetic, who says, if the below analysis is correct, and I think everyone, anyone observing this war would agree it is, then my fear is that it doesn't matter how limited or restrained Iran's response is. Yanyahu will use it as a pretext for another proclamation because he's bent on starting this war. Um, so actually, if you scroll down yeah. to the actual article, um, so this is what BB hoped to achieve with the attack on the consulate. So Mm -hmm. he said the prime minister had the following objectives, extend the status for war and with it, the emergency rules that will keep him in power for now by reminding everyone that Iran will retaliate as a threat. He's also managed to silence the little criticism that has started to come from Washington concerning his operations in Gaza. It's very unlikely that anyone there will say anything against Israel over the coming few days. He's also going to accelerate the delivery of the weapons that Biden has promised, including the critical F-35 fighter jet, jet fighters. Critically, he is also going to silence the opposition within his own country. He will stop the, the, the right of demonstrations on the basis that Israelis are all under the threat of Iran. Interesting. Interesting little tidbit on that one. Yeah. Um, okay. The Council of American Islamic Relations, the nation's largest Muslim civil rights group, argued that the Biden administration emboldened the far-right Israeli government to manufacture this crisis by repeatedly giving it carte blanche to violate international law without any accountability. From murdering journalist Shireen al-Abdul Kaleh to expanding illegal settlements to committing a genocide in Gaza to bombing an Iranian embassy complex in Syria. Um, Sana. Saeed, a media critic with AJ+, said on social media Saturday that there will be lots of incoming analysis for the next several hours, but there's really just one thing to know. None of this was inevitably was inevitable, nor did it start with Iran. This is U.S.-Israeli belligerence. This is Joe Biden's foreign policy and Israel's war expansionism as it conducts a genocide. Trita Parsi, an expert of Iran and the Middle East and an EVP at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, yeah. also weigh in on social media, pointing to a specific example over from over 25 years ago that shows that the Iranian retaliation against Israel perhaps had been evaded. The US, UK, and France prevented the UN Security Council from condemning the Israeli attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, despite it being a flagrant violation of international law. Parsi highlighted. The Iranians have hinted that had the US, UNC, UNSC strongly condemned Israel, Iran might have refrained from retaliating against it. So, which uh, was why I said earlier if US or any of the allied nations had condemned Israel, then had to, you know, yeah. do the do, so to speak. Certainly, the 1998 episode does not prove that Iran's retaliation against Israel today could have been prevented. But it does suggest that there was an opportunity to de-escalate that the UK, US, France ignored or dismissed, he added. Then again, that fits perfectly with Biden's record of the past seven months as opportunity after opportunity to de-escalate and end the war in Gaza 
has been actively dismissed by him. So, okay. any thoughts before? No, we go I on? mean, I, I, I think that that the fact that he's using it to like, um, stamp down protests and stuff of himself. That's that's something I haven't heard before. Mm -hmm. So interesting there, but yeah, please continue. I would like to learn yeah. more. So this is a subsite article that Charlton Nuno Marquez, a friend of the show, uh, he had it posted on his own substat. So I was perusing through it, just trying to get more information. I came across this article. Coming to Simplicica. a substat um, newsletter near you. <laughs> So uh, this is a long article. He's definitely a war connoisseur because he gave a lot of information about the missiles that were used. Okay. We don't need to know all that stuff. If you're interested in that, the subtitle mm -hmm. article is linked in the description. Mm -hmm. um, but he does make mention of a few things that are interesting mm. uh, that I will highlight here. But okay. his article is called Iran Breaches Anglo Zionist Defenses in Historic Attack, a Breakdown. So he writes Iran made history Saturday by launching Operation to Trump Promise. In okay. our usual style here, let's cut through all the noise currently clogging up social networks and decisively demonstrate the facts as thoroughly as possible, while also pointing out how this was a game changing and historical event which has brought Iran onto the world stage in a big way. Yep. Firstly, as establishment, Iran's stated goal for the operation was to strike back at the basis from which the Israeli consular attack was launched on April 1st. Uh, IRGC has listed its objectives for the last night's <laughs> missile attack. Ramon and Nevertim air bases where attack on Iran consulate was conducted from. Israeli Air Force's intelligence HQ in Tel Aviv, where attack on Iran consulate was planned, and degrading of Israel's air defense radars and assets. So essentially, the targets were air bases, essentially. Yeah. Uh, from ben Gavir, right? Yeah. Um, um, the footage is of the intelligence HQ getting hit. I've yet to see evidence of 99% interception. Ramon has been badly hit. Neta team has, was hit by more than seven missiles. Air Force Intelligence HQ completely leveled. Other strikes on air defense installations obviously not close to population centers and out of view, but I'm sure that Sat intel, intel. Saturday's inte yeah. intel was sure extent of damage. I, I think this is, speaks to... so. Friend of the show, Fee, has, you know, I've had conversations with her about the paper tiger that is the Israeli military and U.S. military in return. I've also seen it when in regards to the Russian front, right, where essentially warfare has changed to be uh, who can do it the most monetarily effective, right? right? So right. you're talking about the cheaper missiles, the cheaper drones, it, it, like the stuff that's <coughs> easier to produce if it's effective and waste your enemy's money to the tune right. of how much is an iron, iron dome armament, right? I'm sure it's a multi-million dollar smart thing or whatever that we pay for, right? That's wasting yeah. our money. They're essentially right. siege warfaring the entire continent. So but you know what? It, 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 isn't that typical of the U.S. though to spend lots and lots of money by flight? Um, yes. To spend lots and lots of money for subpar work. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah uh, and a, a gonna... hammer in the army costs you, you know, a hundred dollars or whatever, when it could be made for the same thing, made for much cheaper. Cheaper you know? and more effective. So, yeah. So. Yeah, that's what you're finding out All with right. tanks and whatever, like, as long as it works, that's all that matters. Um, so anyway, <laughs> Navateem Air Base in the south of Occupy Palestine 
Ramon Air Base in the south of Occupy Palestine. The Israeli top secret intelligence spy base in Jabal al Sheikh, Mount Ham Herman, 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 Herman in the north of the occupied Golan Heights. It should be noted that the rest of the explosions or hits in other areas of the occupied territories are related to the confrontation of the Israeli air defense systems with the projectiles in the sky or the falling of the wreckage of the interceptor missiles or the wreckage of Iranian missiles. Yeah. So, so if you want to take a look at this map. There's the Golan um, Heights. Here's Damascus, yes. right? So this is the first strike, right? right? So this is not the West Bank right here. This ain't it. Like, here's the West Bank and, like, this little strip over here with Gaza, right? So... Mm -hmm. Hamas is here, supposedly, allegedly, right? Not over here, I think partially, but right. definitely not up here, right? And we so definitely those already... The ones that are, are the strikes from Iran that reached the ground. So... Right. So reported explosions in the sky are the black sky. ones. The black so ones. here, here, here. These are actual, the air base, Eight. the Arad region, and this other air base. Definitely right. got through. So, <coughs> and and we apparently we didn't use hypersonics, right? That didn't mm -hmm. happen. So Iran still has those. Yeah. Right. It was used for some cluster munition type stuff, some like pre flak to mess with the Iron Dome. Like the Iron Dome is not perfect, and it's definitely less perfect than ninety nine percent. So. Right. I mean, they were actively having to shoot down stuff with aircraft. They were sending manned aircraft to fight this. Mm -hmm. So that's people. You you got to then expend and fuel and more money. So as long as Iran can keep chucking some rocks over occasionally, you know, that's going to eat up some funds. And I'm sure then they'll ask us for more money. So, yes. yes, you know, um, so, so this is from Ashmat X on Twitter, who tweeted Iran from 1057.54 miles away, targeted Israeli, Israel's military, military infrastructure located, located in densely populated areas and didn't kill a single civilian. That mm. means the U.S. and Israel can do the same, but chooses not to. Which we've talked about. We've had Air Force personnel talk about, you know, that they can see inside these buildings. They have more than the capability right. to target properly. And in fact, at some point, probably next week, I think I'm going to do a story on the Lavender program. Right? You heard about this? The uh, Lavender mm -hmm. AI. So this is Israel's AI targeting system. Right? Which um, they had a system that was, it was quote, I've heard called the who's your daddy protocol, where's daddy protocol, what? right? I'll explain. So what that was doing was, from my remembering, um, it was if the father would leave the household, right? That mm. counted as he's Hamas, then, if he's leaving the house away from the family, not protecting them, right? They would then target the family and the children first, and then, you know, deal with the father later. Mm -hmm. Right? Something along those lines. Um, and this is the AI they're using to choose targets in Israel. It's an AI based system. So, computers choosing to do that. And I'm sure that so Israel can blame it on the, you know, computer and not them. They were right. just following the computer's orders. Well, you shouldn't have installed fucking Nazi 19 fucking, you know, as your OS. Like, that, that shouldn't have been what you did. But anyway, um, yeah, I'll go into that at some point, probably next week. Okay. So. All right. So. Now, let's get down to the nuts and bolts. This strike was unprecedented for several important reasons. 
Firstly, it was, of course, the first Iranian strike on Israeli soil directly from Iranian soil itself, rather than utilizing proxies from Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, etc. This alone was a big watershed milestone that has opened up all sorts of potentials for escalation. Whoops. Secondly, it was one of the most advanced and longest range peer-to-peer -peer style exchanges in history. Even in Russia, where I've noted we have seen the first ever truly modern near peer conflict with unprecedented scenes never before witnessed, like when highly advanced NATO storm shadow missiles flew to Crimea while literally in the same moments, advanced Russian Kybers flew past them in the opposite direction. Such an exchange has never been witnessed before, as we become accustomed to watching NATO pound on weaker unarmed uh, opponents over the last few decades. But no, last night Iran upped the ante even more, because even in Russia, such exchanges at least happened directly over the Russian border onto its neighbor, where logistics and ISR is, for obvious reasons, much simpler. But Iran did something unprecedented. They conducted the first ever modern, potentially hypersonic assault on an enemy with SRBMs and MRBMs across a vast, vast multi-domain space covering several countries and time zones and potentially as much as 1,200 to 2,000 kilometers. Additionally, Iran did this all with potentially hypersonic weapons which peeled back another layer of sophistication that included such things, such things as possible endo-atmospheric interception attempts with Israeli arrow-free ABM missiles. The U.S. scrambled a large coalition to shoot the threats down, which included the U.S. itself, UK flying, over, flying from Cyprus, France, and controversially Jordan, which allowed them to use all of its airspace and even partook in the shootdowns. There are now two chief competing takes on the situation. One says that Iran was humiliated. Uh, this is the Zionist talking point. As Israel intercepted everything, and more importantly, that Iran has blown its only advantage of surprise and strategic uncertainty slash ambiguity by showing its hand and not achieving much. They argue that Iran's one true advantage over Israel was the threat that it could affect a mass launch of its feared ballistic missiles, wiping out huge swaths at Israel. But now that the perceived damage from the attack was low, Iran yeah. has shown itself to be weaker than expected, which could endue Israel with even more courage and motivation to continue striking and provoking Iran, as they might see they have nothing to fear from Iran's long tooted missiles. This Which is I certainly heard a Putin pretty much okay. give them give them credit, I think, yesterday or whatever, uh, sometime this week, where it was essentially he was pouting their like measured response. Um I think this is the, the quote. <coughs> right. This is certainly a reasonable argument. I'm not saying it's totally wrong. We simply don't know for a fact because of the affirmation reasons that one, we don't actually know how much damage the strikes cause due to Israel's obvious lies of 100% interceptions and disproved fates. Two, we don't know whether it was merely Iran's goal to do a light showing in the interest of escalation management, i.e., they may not have wanted to cause too much damage deliberately simply to send a message, but to keep from provoking Israel to respond too aggressively. Iran is said to have thousands of such missiles, so obviously having launched only 70 plus or so is likely not indica indicative of a major attack task with actual causing serious destruction to Israeli infrastructure. Then there's the converse side. Iran came out the big winner by demonstrating the all, the, all the previously outlined abilities of bypassing the West's densest AD shields. Here's why I think in some ways this conclusion to be the more correct in the long term. First, one of the common counter arguments is that Israel possesses nuclear weapons, which ultimately trumps anything Iran can throw at them. But in reality, now that Iran has proven the ability to penetrate Israel, 
Iran too can cause nuclear devastation by striking the Israeli Daimona nuclear power plant. Destroying nuclear plants would produce far much more radioactive chaos than a relatively clean modern nuclear weapons. Uh, furthermore, Israel. Okay. Furthermore, Israel is, furthermore, Israel is much smaller than the comparatively giant Iran. Iran can take many nuclear hits and survive, but a single mass nuclear event in Israel could eradicate the entire country, making it uninhabitable. Oh, God. That's bad, Colin. <laughs> that's, like, more than bad. Right. That's, that's talk of what from uh, I've heard from Tara when she was working as a congressional aide that they were talking about things like a um, what, what was the phrasing uh, you know the tactical use of nukes a, a limited nuclear war right mm -hmm. there is no such thing right like so, the fact that Israel in any way is thinking that that's a problem is not good. Right. That's that Armageddon clock getting getting closer. So, that's, that's bad. Ugh. Okay. Um, secondly, recall the main fear of Iraqi scarabs and suits back in the day that they could contain chemical biological warheads. Iran, too, could technically load its missiles with all kinds of nasty goodies of this sort, either chembio, even enriched uranium, which has a plenty to create a dirty bomb. Now that we know it can penetrate Israel easily, Iran could actually wipe out the country with a mass unenriched nuclear, chemical, or biological attack with these now-proven hyper- or quasi-hypersonic ballistics. Uh -huh. That threat alone now presents a psychological Dam Damocles sword that will act as Damocles yeah, that Greek. will act as an asymmetrical deterrent or counter to any Israel Israeli Samson option threat. Yeah. Thirdly, this was Iran's very first foray into a de direct strike. It can be argued that they gain critical data and metrics from the entire Western alliance's defensive capabilities, as well as Israeli defensive vulnerabilities. That mean, this means that there is an implied threat that any future attack of this scale could be far more effective, as Iran may now calibrate said attack to maximize what, what it saw were any failings or weaknesses on its part on Saturday. Russia has had two years of launching such strikes, and it has only been semi recently that we've that they've collaborated and fine tuned the precise timings of the sophisticated multi layered drone ALCM ballistic triple threat attack. Yeah. Iran can improve with each iteration as well as maximize, streamline the effectiveness which to each attempt. Yep. Um, fourthly, there's a now confirmed mass discrepancy of operational costs. So this is from, if you zoom in, please, from OSINT Defender, who tweeted, Israel defense of Saturday's Iranian missile and drone attack is estimated to have costed over $1.3 in jet fuel, service-to-air missile interceptors, air-to-air -air missiles, and other military equipment that was utilized by Israeli air defense array with an hour-free hypersonic ballist anti-ballistic missile alone believed to cost between Five to twenty million. Okay, just in so, one in one night in night. one night, five to twenty million dollars. Right, one point three billion in jet fuel alone in one night. Like I was saying earlier. Yeah, like this is. They're trying to like, uh, you know, wait them out and see if they run out. Right. And then they're going to ask us for more money, and we're already upset that they're asking for money. More, right. So Ukraine is all over again, basically. Yes. Yeah, but more so now. Right. You know. <clears throat> okay. And, and now we're wanting to sanction them. Right. Economically. Like, we think that's right. going to help? 
We're right. spending way more than we're ever going to sanction them, like, away from. They will still make money, money without is, us. This is what your money is going to, folks. <laughs> oh, God. Yep. One confirmed source claimed Iran's attack cost as little as $30 million, while the yeah. number floated for the West interceptions is around $1 billion to $1.3 so that's a lot more than 30 million i know it's right. i know it's just one zero to you people but that's over three times the amount and right. 30 million so, is a lot of dollars right already so in layman's terms iran barely showed what they're capable of with less with less so <laughs> oh dude that's and this is a conservative so it, estimate of right. course it is. So basically, so basically, Israel, do you want to do the dance? Do you want that dance? It doesn't sound like that they wanted to escalate things from what I heard. So doesn't mean they won't. Right. We'll, we'll see. The point is that just that we're in the midst of the Houthis having proven the West's total inability to sustain defense against mass persistent drone swarms, uh -huh. here to Iran they have just proven an absolutely lethal inability of Israel and the West to sustain against a potential long drawn out Iranian strike campaign, i.e. one prosecuted over the course of days or weeks with consistent ma daily mass barrages. Such a yep. campaign would likely critically deplete the West's ability to shoot down even the lowest-scale Shahid drone threat. Just look at Ukraine. It's going through the same lesson as we speak. Bro, what did I talk about? Have we talked about drone swarms before on the show? Yes. Welcome to the arms Quiet. race. <laughs> Welcome to the arms race. That's what we're doing. That's what all of this is. So, fun. Lastly, what does this mean? One neglected consequence of this is that Iran now stands to feel the ability to total disrupt Israeli's economic way of life. If Iran were to engage in a committed campaign of mass strikes, it could totally paralyze the Israeli economy by making entire areas uninhabitable, causing mass immigrations in the same way the Hamas attack led to thousands of Israelis to flee. Unlike Israel's barbaric and savage genocide aimed primarily at civilians, last night's Iranian attack exclusively targeted its military sites. But if Iran wanted to, they can launch mass infrastructure attacks in the way Russia has now down to Ukraine's energy grids, further compounding the economic damage. In short, Iran can mire Israel in months and years long economic malaise or outright devastation. Um, of course, at that point, the question of the U.S. coming to help is brought up, but clearly, desperate for an off-ramp, Biden stated, um, so this was from Axios, um, where Biden told BB U.S. won't support an Israeli counterattack on Iran. Yay. Um, President Biden told Israeli Prime Minister BB during a call on Saturday that the U.S. won't support any Israeli counterattack against Iran. A senior White House official told Axios. Yep. So, U.S. knows what's up, at least for now. The mm -hmm. final aspect of consideration is to remember that all of the preceding and ensuing events could very well be part of the Israeli plan. Recall, Israel, Israel didn't choose to blow up the Iranian embassy, a huge, unprecedented maneuver, and slaughter Iranian generals just for its health. Allegedly. This appeared to Allegedly, this appeared part of a clear strategy of escalation aimed at baiting Iran into an escalatory spiral, presumably with the end goal of drawing the U.S. into a large-scale war to cut down Iran once and for all. In light of that, some experts now speculate that Iran foolishly fell into the trap. However, as stated earlier, Iran can be said to have wisely managed the escalation for precisely this reason to show its strength while not going too far in a way that would invite a wilder American response, or even an Israeli one for that matter. Um, why now? Why did Israel bait Iran into 
an action at this precise moment. The clue to the answer lies in the news from several days ago that is Israel totally withdrew its forces from Khan Yunus. Yeah. So if you zoom in, uh, Israel withdraws from Khan Yunus as Gaza hits six month mark. Actually, you can zoom out. Uh, so they withdrew. I suspect that Israel, or BB for that matter, in particular, is facing failure after not having accomplished any of the stated objectives, and thus is desperate to create a new distraction as a vector for continuing the war in some way that can keep the world and Israelis from reaching the conclusion that the war has been totally lost. Mm. Um, have you seen this latest pawn shelf from Haaretz? We've oh, lost. Okay. Truth must be told. The inability to admit it encapsulates everything you need to know about Israel's individual and mass psychology. There's a clear, sharp, predictable reality that we should begin to fathom, to process, to understand, and to draw conclusions from for the future. It's no fun to admit that we lost, so we lie to ourselves. Some of us maliciously lie, others innocently. It would be better to find solace in some airy carb with a total victory crust. But it might be just a bagel. When the solace ends, the whole remains. There's no way around it. The good guys don't always win. The astonishing article, which jibes with the sentiments of many Israelis, goes on. After half a year, we could have been in a totally different place, but we've been held hostage by the worst leadership in the country's history and a decent contender for the title of worst leadership anywhere ever. Every military undertaking is supposed to have a diplomatic exit. The military action should lead to a better diplomatic reality. Israel has no diplomatic exit. The article concludes that the calculus has changed and that Israelis may now never be able to return to the northern border given the situation with Hezbollah. That sounds a lot like blaming Bibi, what it sounds like. Well, um... in short, this is why... BB needs an escalation. It's to divert attention from the ongoing catastrophe of Israel's potential defeat to Hamas, the catastrophic loss of standing of Israel's image to the world community, the complete turning against Israel by the entire world. Rather than admit defeat and face the end of his career, as well as the coming trials and tribunals that will put him in jail, he chose to take the only remaining option, to continue escalating in the hopes that wide scale war could wash away his sins and undo his past mistakes. Unfortunately, just like the ill fated Zelensky, Netanyahu's doomed plan appears destined to coincide with the US's historic decline, reaching its zenith now in its pivotal year of 2024. Yay! So, I have one more article. It was from Caitlin, but anything you want to add nope. before we end? This? I've been adding it. When I when I see it, pretty much. All right. So, um, so I wanted to bring this to uh, friend Caitlin. Uh, has a slight different take compared to Simplicicus from his article. Um, but she writes, Israel's latest lie is that it has no choice but to attack Iran. Mm -hmm. Oh, went backwards. All right. In an article titled, Israel Vows to Retaliate Against Iran from Missile Attacks, Axios reports that the Israeli defense minister has informed his American partner that Israel has no choice but to attack Iran for the retaliatory strike it launched in response to Israel's deadly attack on the Iranian embassy in Damascus. Israel, Israeli Minister of Defense Yov, is that how you say it? Yov Galant, yeah. Your you have... So, Defense Secretary Lord Austin Sunday that Israel has no choice but to respond to the unprecedented missile and drone attack launched by Iran over the weekend, reports Axios, tying yeah. an anonymous U.S. official and other unnamed source. The state of Israel has been churning out massive lies on a daily basis for the last six months, but this waffle could wind up being the most consequential. Obviously, Israel has a choice as to whether it continues to escalate a conflict it initiated with an extreme act of aggression. This fraudulent apartheid ethnostate is so accustomed to crying victim every minute of every day 
that it will even pretend to be the victim of its own conscious decisions. As Professor Jason Hickel put it on Twitter, people need to understand that Israel does not need to retaliate. Iran's action was a telegraph response to Israel's bombing of its consulate, which killed 16 people and violated the Geneva Convention. Geneva mm -hmm. Convention. Iran says they're now considering the matter closed. The Israel Convention. must escalate. By the way, not the Geneva, the, the Vienna Convention. Vienna, yes. <laughs> yeah, no worries. That Iran makes sense. Probably did the Geneva Convention too, honestly. Right. If we're going to talk. So, no. Iran's Deputy Foreign Minister Ali Bagari has made it clear that if Israel launches a against Iran, this time Iran's response will be instantaneous instead of a 12 day grace period with Tehran giving neighboring countries and the United States a 72-hour advance warning. warning to ensure minimal damage to Israel. See, that's what people, I think, are not necessarily talking about. Yeah. We knew that this was happening. Of course so, um, so the idea that it was provoked, allegedly, yeah. is bullshit. Because... If it were unprovoked, they would have just done it immediately or probably within the following day. But they did this within a week and a half of the attack. Okay. So, predictably, the Biden administration is doing its usual phony stick where it pretends to be a passive witness to all this, with National Security Spokesperson John Kirby telling the press that the White House plans to just wait and see what the Israelis decide to do. But as foreign policy analyst Tariq Kenny Shawa noted of Kirby's statement, Israel will be using U.S. supply weapons, will have to coordinate with U.S. forces throughout the region, and will depend on the U.S. for missile defense when Iran responds. So the fact that the U.S. won't be actively planning an attack with Israel doesn't mean the U.S. won't be involved in it, on a fundamental level. <clears throat> if Israel's escalatory attack happens, it will be because Washington allowed it to. If the U.S. informed Israel that it will instantly lose its pricey U.S. weapon supplies and Pentagon support if it attacks Iran, Israel would discover very quickly that it does in fact have a choice as to whether or not to proceed. Um... So this is from Trisha Parsi. My latest for at foreign policy on Iran, Gaza, and Israel. Biden's support for Israel is often described as a continuation of a long-standing U.S. policy. In reality, it is a break with tradition. Previous presidents regularly twisted Israel's arm if needed, and we've talked about this before. Um, in an article of foreign policy titled Netanyahu wants war with Iran, Biden can prevent it. Quincy Institute Par Parsi argues that while Biden's unconditional support for Israel is often described as a continuation of longstanding U.S. policy, it has actually been a rather dramatic break from the norm. Presidents like Reagan, both Bushes, and Obama have not hesitated to give Israel's arm a twist whenever they found it necessary to advance U.S. interests in the region. This new policy of just letting Tel Aviv do whatever it wants while providing unconditional support is actually without president in the White House. So again, Thanks, that's Obama. something. Yeah, so that's also something that is not necessarily talked about. And we talked about it on Reagan. Yeah. Well, we more specifically, Reagan has set has resolved in not giving conditions. Um, in certain instances with Israel in order to go too far. And by, and I wonder if, honestly, in thinking about this now, I wonder if that has to do with the amount that APAC has given Biden. That would be kind of interesting to kind of see, um, maybe in comparison to the other presidents. Mm -hmm. um, I think Biden has gotten, what, like $4 million from them? Something like that. So it'll be interesting if anyone knows in the chat like how much the other presidents have gone as far as funding from APAC. This might explain why Biden has actually been just like whatever, let Israel do whatever. Yeah. Um, but but we've talked about on the show how even 
I don't think necessarily Obama, but even Obama, I don't think he particularly likes Yanyahu really. So yeah. Um so it so it was easy for him to kind of be like no in certain instances, but right. But anyway, <clears throat> both Israel and the US are pretending to be powerless in this situation when in reality they're both anything but. They're like two muggers getting ready to mug someone and saying if only there was something we can do to stop this terrible mugging. <laughs> Israel, Israel nope. absolutely can choose not to accelerate towards a terrifying war between extremely powerful militaries, and the U.S. can absolutely can choose to pump the brakes. The fact is that the fact that neither of them are doing so is just what it looks like when you live under a globe-spanning empire that is fueled by human blood. So. So we'll see what happens, but, you know, essentially it would be to Israel's demise and by us by extension, yeah. if we bait Iran more, because as I said, Iran was able to do a lot with less and they didn't even pull out all the stops. So imagine what Iran could possibly do with the tactical advantage that they allegedly have, that they can knock out Israel completely, yeah. and by extension, the West, and more specifically us, in terms of the amount of money that we spend in order to try and keep up with Iran, and right. we can't. So um, we'll see what happens, but, you know... Um, but right now, the fact that the U.S. is kind of being like, you know, we we ain't touching that kind of is promising, but how long that's going to last, we don't know. Depending, it, it pretty much will be up to Yan Yahoo what he tries to do. But yeah. I wonder if this might be the beginning of the end of Israel in terms of this actually might be the catalyst for it. Um, for there to be conditions, given the amount of money that we would have to spend in order to, you know, just at least break even with Iran as far as military might. But, but then again, the U.S. has been known to do sh stupid shit anyway. So, you know, anything to start a war. So who knows? Yep. Well, hopefully YouTube doesn't want to go to war with us. Uh, and take this video down. You know, it's already first strike us with a demonetization. So you can always go to codeshv.com slash injuries network if you want to fight back against that. You know, scan the QR code on your screen, put exclamation mark, donate in the chat. You can chat to us. But always very nice. If you can't give monetarily, <coughs> very easy. Hit the like and subscribe button, share, leave a comment. Do all those engagement things you gotta do. Um, you know, you can always go sub to us on Rockfin and Rumble as well. If you haven't done that already, I'll leave that in the chat for people. Uh, Rumble and Rockfin. And I can go check that. Um, let's see, Madmon, uh, Madmon there on the, on the Rockfin showing up. And Amir's still holding it down. I think she said 11 million for Biden. Um, from APAC. 11 million? I would guess. Yeah. Okay. Allegedly. Um, Anna Mayer says she got us on Cash App. Well, we appreciate that, Anna. I don't know how much, but we appreciate that. Um, so, and she says she loves Caitlin so much. Hmm. So, couldn't agree more. Caitlin. Caitlin's pretty great. Um, let's check out the Rumble. Ghost are still there. Go fuck Google showed up when a Zionazi programmed the AI. The AI, by definition, is Zionazi. So, yep. So, we're going to get into some of that. Um, so, Colin, I'm sorry this is going to be long, <laughs> but we're going to do it. Because I think it's important and no one else has talked about it. I think no one else has talked about it for multiple reasons. We'll come to find out 
shortly. Um, this is going to be one of those things where you're like, why did you cover this? And it's like, oh, I know why you covered this. So, mm. um, I'm referencing I, a lyric by Jesse Jet, have, the title. I just have to use a little boys room, so you can start by, I can hear you. Cool. Uh, and I'll be back in a second. Yes, sir. Can do. So, again, this is from Neuralink Volunteers, right? We're gonna we're gonna start there. We're gonna talk about some Neuralink stuff. So this is sheer post, right? Um, it's actually unlimited hangout with Stravula Pats, who I think is also over there at uh, the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Available to do stuff there. Um, she's she's doing it up. So, um, but she's talking about uh, weaponizing reality and the dawn of neuro warfare. Neuro warfare, you might ask what that might be. Um, we're going to get into it. So we're going to start with B- billionaire Elon Musk's brain-computer interface company Neuralink made headlines earlier this year for inserting its first brain implant into a human being. Musk says such implants, which are described as fully implantable, cosmetically invisible, and designed to let you control a computer or mobile device anywhere you go, are slated to eventually offer full bandwidth data streaming to the brain, straight to the membrane. Brain company, uh, brain computer interfaces, BCIs, are quite the human achievement. As described by the University of Calgary, a brain computer interface, BCI, is a system that determines functional intent, the desire to change, move, control or interact with something in your environment directly from your brain activity. In other words, BCIs allow you to control an application or device using only your mind. Any questions so far, Care Bear? No? Everything makes sense? Yes. Oh, there you go. Telling you, there we go. Oh. You caught up to you. Okay. Cool. Um, you were saying? Uh, so basically, it's the little they want to control. In some cases, yes, but it's more in this instance, you being able to control other things. So, but yes. Um, so, developers and advocates of BCIs and adjacent technologies emphasize that they can help people regain abilities lost due to aging, ailments, accidents, or injuries, thus improving quality of life. A brain implant created by Swiss-based Ecola Polytechnique Federale in Lausanne, for example, has allowed a paralyzed man to walk again just by thinking. Others go further. Neuralink's goal is to help people surpass able-bodied human performance. Yet, great ethical concerns arise with such advancements, and the tech is already being used for questionable (coughs) purposes to better plan logistics and boost productivity. For example, some Chinese employers have started using emotional surveillance technology to monitor workers' brain waves, which, combined with AI algorithms, can spot incidents of workplace rage, anxiety, or sadness. The example showcases how personal technology can become it is normalized in daily life. Wouldn't you like that, Colin, as you're keeping the kiddos? An, an emotional tracking device? Wouldn't that be fun? Um, but the ethical... Oh, no, he's going to kill one of them kids. <laughs> like, uh, anyway, so the ethical ramifications of DCIs and other emergency neurotechnologies don't stop the consumer market or the workplace. Governments and militaries are already discussing and experimenting on the roles they could play in wartime. We can't have a technology without it needed for war, Care Bear. Indeed, many are describing the human body and brain as war's next domain with a 2020 NATO-backed paper on cognitive warfare describing the phenomenon's objective as making everyone a weapon. The brain will be the battlefield of the 21st century. The NATO-backed paper in 2020, Care Bear. Okay? So, On this new battlefield, an era of neuroweapons, which can broadly be defined as technologies and systems that can either enhance or damage a warfighter or target cognitive and or physical abilities, 
otherwise attack people or critical societal infrastructure has begun. In this exploration of the race to apply the latest neuron technologies to war and beyond, I investigated how the neural weapons of tomorrow, including BCIs that may allow for brain-to-brain -brain or brain-to-machine communication, and the capacity to expand conflicts into a new domain, the brain, while also bringing a new dimension to both hard and soft power struggles of the future. In response to ongoing neurotechnology developments, some alleged neural rights will protect people's minds from possible privacy infringements and a myriad of ethical issues that new neurotechnologies may pose in need. Come, however, neural rights advocates close proximity to the very organizations advancing these neurotechnologies deserve scrutiny and potentially suggest the neural rights movement is poised instead to normalize advanced neurotechnology presence in daily life, perhaps forever changing human relationships with machines, and I'm sure that will be for both good and bad. Indeed, neuroscience's very origin lie in a war, as Dr. Wallace Mendelssohn explains in Psych Today, just as American neurology was born in the Civil War, the roots of neuroscience are embedded in World War II. He explains that while the bond between war on neuroscience has contributed to meaningful advances with human condition, like the improved understanding of ailments like PTSD, it has left some worried about neuroscience possible military applications. Controversial yet well known government's attempts to learn more about the brain include Project Blue, uh, Bluebird slash Artichoke, a 1950s era project that worked to determine whether people could be involuntarily made to carry out assassinations through hypnosis as well as the especially infamous MK Ultra, where human mind control experiments were carried out in a variety of institutions in the 1950s and 60s. These projects' respective conclusions, however, did not signal an end to the U.S. government's interest in invasive mind studies and technology. Rather, governments internationally have been interested in the brain sciences ever since, investing heavily in neuroscience and neurotech research. That's where some of that military tax funding is going to found. Initiative and research explored in this article, like the Brain Initiative and the United States Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, otherwise known as DARPA, their next generation non surgical neurotechnology are often portrayed as altruistic strides towards improving brain health, helping people recover lost physical or mental abilities, and otherwise improving quality of life. Unfortunately, a deeper look reveals a prioritization of military might. The military is intensely interested in emerging neurotechnologies. The Pentagon's research arm, DARPA, directly or indirectly funds about half of invasive neural interface technology companies in the U.S. In fact, as Nico McCarthy and Milan Sikovic highlight in their 2023 write-up of Dar DARPA's neurotech efforts, that DARPA has initiated at least 40 neurotechnology-related programs over the past 24 years. From the interface, describes the current state of affairs as DARPA funding effectively driving the BCI research agenda. Look, there you go, Colin. That that can, you know, invade your nightmares. This is this is the future soldier at U.S. Army Recruiting Command. Look look how look how cute he looks. He's got the little alien gun and everything. It's fun. Um. So as we shall see. Before you before you yes. can hold on. Before you, what is our Cash App link? Do what? Oh, uh, it should be uh, Money Sign Indie News Network, I think. I it, hold on. Uh, I have to go all the way to the top. I'm at slide 107. I think like slide right before this. CashApp.com slash Money Sign Indie News Network. That's it. So what slide was on? 103. Right. I think so. One oh three. Um. So controversial. Yes, that's what we just did. Um. I might have went to. There we go. So, uh, as we shall see, such projects, many of which focus on somehow enhancing the capabilities of the recipient or wearer of a given piece of technology, are making activities like telepathy, mind control. And mind reading, once the stuff of science fiction, at least plausible, if not tomorrow's reality. So, 
As McCarthy and Sikovic explain on their Substack, for example, the 1999 DARPA funded fundamental research at the BioInfo Micro Interface Program led to significant firsts in brain computer interfaces research, including allowing monkeys to learn to control a brain machine interface to reach and grab objects without moving their arm. In another project from the program, monkeys learn to position cursors on a computer screen without the animals emitting any behavior, where signals extrapolated from the monkey's moving skulls were read and decoded to move the mouse. McCarthy and Sikovic also highlight that in more recent years, the DARPA funded scientists have also created the world's most dexterous bionic arm with biodirectional controls, have used brain computer interfaces to accelerate memory formation and recalling and have even transferred a memory, a specific neural firing pattern, from one rat to another, with a rat receiving the memory, almost instantaneously learned, to perform a task that simply took weeks of training to learn. Okay? Does that sound like the right. Matrix to you? Um, yes. Sounds like it to me. Um, just download Kung Fu. So, this is from a TED Med app. So, I'm going to throw this on it. Um, but this is this will explain a bit of what was happening. We started with a superstar monkey called Aurora. That Aurora, that's who we started with. Became one of the superstars of this field. And Aurora liked to play video games. As you can see here, <laughs> she likes to use a joystick like any one of us, any of our kids, to play this so game. And as a good do? primate, she even tries to cheat before she gets the right answer. So even before a target appears that she's supposed to cross so the cursor, that she's controlling with this joystick, so there's, Aurora there's is trying to there. find the target, no matter where it is. And if she's doing that, because every time she crosses that target with the little cursor, she gets a drop of Brazilian orange juice. And I can tell you, any monkey will do anything for you if you get the little drop of Brazilian orange juice. <laughs> Actually, any primate will do that. Think about that. Well, while Aurora was playing this game, as you saw, and doing, you know, a thousand trials a day and getting 97% correct and 350 ml of orange juice, we were recording the brainstorms they were producing in her head and sending to a robotic arm that was learning to reproduce the movements that Aurora was making. Because the idea was to actually turn on this brain-machine interface and have Aurora play the game just by thinking, without the interference of her body. Her brainstorms would control an arm that would move the cursor and cross the target. And to our shock, that's exactly what Aurora did. She played the game without moving her body. So every trajectory that you see the cursor now, this is the exact first moment she got that. That's the exact first moment a brain intention was liberated from the physical domains of a, of a body of a primate and could act outside in that outside world just by controlling an artificial device. And Aurora kept playing the game, kept, kept finding that little target and getting the orange juice that she wanted to get, that she craved for. Well, she did that because she, at that time, had acquired a new arm. The robotic arm that you see moving here 30 days later, after the first um, video that I showed to you, is under the control of Aurora's brain and is moving the cursor to get to the target. And Aurora now knows that she can play the game with this robotic arm, but she has not lost the ability to use her biological arms to do what she pleases. She can scratch her back, she can scratch one of us, she can play another game. By all purposes and means, Aurora's brain has incorporated that artificial device as an extension of her body. The model of the self that Aurora had in her mind has been expanded to get one more arm. Well, we did that 10 years ago. Just feed forward 10 years. Just last year, we realized that you don't need even to have a robotic device. You can just build a computational body, an avatar, a monkey avatar. And you can actually use it for uh, our monkeys to either interact with them, or you can train them to assume in a virtual world the first person's perspective of that avatar and use her brain activity to control the movements of the avatar arms or legs. And what we did basically was to train the animals to learn how to control these avatars and explore objects that appear in a virtual world. 
And these objects are visually identical, but when the avatar crosses the surface of these objects, there is an electrical message, message that is proportional to the microtactile texture of the object that goes back directly to the monkey's brain. Did you, did you catch that? What yeah. that was doing? So that's, you know, if yeah. it's over an object, it will send a signal to the brain so that, like, it knows what's, like, the right signal. So without hearing anything, without seeing anything, it is getting tactile feedback. Informing the brain what is that the avatar is touching. And in just four weeks, the brain learns to process this new sensation and acquires a new sensory pathway, like a new sense. And you truly liberate the brain now because you are allowing the brain to send motor commands to move this avatar, and the feedback that comes from the avatar is being processed directly by the brain without the interference of the skin. So what you see here is this is the design of the task. You're going to see an animal basically touching these three targets, and it has to select one because only one carries uh, the reward, the orange juice that they want to get. And he has to select it by touch using a virtual arm, an arm that doesn't exist. And that's exactly what they do. This is a complete liberation of the brain from the physical constraints of the body in the motor and a perceptual task. The animal is controlling the avatar to touch the targets and is sensing the texture by receiving an electrical message directly in the brain. And the brain is deciding what is the texture associated to the reward. The, the legends that you see in the movie doesn't appear for the monkey. And by the way, they don't read English anyway. So they are here just for you to know that the correct target is shifting position. And yet, they can find them by tactile discrimination, and they can press it and select it. Any questions? Like, what? That's scary. That's scary. Yeah. The, Very. It, it, just, where to begin with this? This is like... <laughs> we, but we, again, thinking... And, and thanks to you... Like, my mind automatically goes this to this now, that it doesn't have to be an arm. Yeah. It could be a drone. Mm -hmm. That you can essentially program a drone, especially in the military, to do whatever you want it to do. Like, yeah. just by thinking, go to this place and uh -huh. do with this thing. Like, that's... That's that drone movie, basically, that you made me watch, like, last As year. One like, of, it's also every dystopian sci-fi, like, ever. This is The Matrix, <laughs> this is Ready Player One. I mean, it's everything that's bad with all of that. So, you're, you're wondering the war effort with this, right? Because that's what I was wondering, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can point at a target and select it. Hmm. So, we're going to make right. things that are unaware of what they're doing, like, target things and you know that's what, what's that uh i'm gonna forget that one ender's game that's like the ender's game thing too he was anyway i won't spoil that for people but you know black mirror episodes it's just the worst so the brain initiative a u.s government initiative founded in 2013 is aimed at revolutionizing our understanding of the human brain to accelerate the capacities of the neuroscience and neurotechnologies inspired by the earlier Human Genome Project, which ran until 2003 and generated the first sequence of the human genome. The Brain Initiative markets itself as an initiative working to address common brain disorders like Alzheimer's and depression through intense research of the brain and its operations. Uh, next. Led by the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, and DARPA, its prominent private partners include the Allen Institute for Brain Sciences, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Kavli Foundation, 
and the Salt Institute for Biological Studies. This mix of actors effectively makes the Brain Initiative an opaque public-private partnership. Like many neurotech and adjacent initiatives, the Brain Initiative depicts itself as a research-forward public effort that can improve human well-being. Yet, cash flow suggests that its priorities lie more in the military sphere. As per 2013 reporting from Scientific American, DARPA is the biggest funder of the Brain Initiative. So, um, Colin, by the way, just try to leave Discord and come back and see if your net fixes a little bit while I continue. Um, but what does DARPA's interest in the Brain Initiative amount to, practically speaking? Apparently, the stuff of science fiction. Um, so, indeed, an article titled DARPA and the Brain Initiative, an apparently now deleted page on DARPA's website, explores DARPA's electronic collaboration with the Brain Initiative. Co-projects include the ElectRx program, which aims to help the human body heal itself through neuromodulation of organ function. Through injectable ultra-miniaturized devices, the Haptics program, which is working on neural interface microsystems that communicate externally to deliver naturalistic sensation, especially to make prosthetic limbs feel and touch naturally. Remember that whole touch target is correct thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. and the RENET program, which aims to create technologies able to extract information from the nervous system quickly enough to control complex machines. Although such projects appeal state-of-the-art technologies to the brain to maximize its utilization in and out of conflict, perhaps one day allow for self-healing, a rehabilitated sense of touch for those with lost limbs and brain-machine communication systems that utilize thoughts to operate for machinery. Adjacent neurotech efforts include DARPA's next-generation non-surgical neurotechnology, which has a budget of at least $125 million. According to DARPA's 2018 funding brief for the project, a neural interface that enables fast, effective, and intuitive hands-free interaction with military systems by able-bodied warfighters is the ultimate program goal. In plain language, the project is about developing technology that can help warfighters interact and command military infrastructure, infrastructure planes, drones, bombs, etc., with their thoughts and without the need for an invasive neurolink style implant. I also believe that, you know, there's plenty of our uh, veterans with wounded limbs and stuff like that that they might still want piloting things. You know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. So, look, there, there they are. Losing their little Xbox controller, right? So this is DARPA's Cognitive Technology Threat Warning System. Combined soldiers, EEG brainwave scanners, 120 megapixel cameras, and multiple computers running cognitive visual processing algorithms into a cybernetic hive mind. Okay. So those words sound fun. Um, <laughs> DARPA has provided funding to a number of institutions and orgs, including Rice University and Vattel, a Columbus, Ohio-based science and technology development company and military intelligence contractor take on critical research towards these ends. According to a Rice University press release, Rice University neuroengineers are leading an ambitious DARPA-funded project to develop Moana, a non-surgical device capable of both encoding neural activity in one person's visual cortex and create, recreating it in another in less than one twentieth of a second. Did you catch that one? Yes. Memory transfer is what that sounds like. Um, the Moana Project researchers have been working on the wireless linkage of brains, even using remote control to hack into fruit fly brain to command their way. Meanwhile, Batiel's uh, in three funds are developing brainstorms. Brainstorms. An injectable, bi-directional brain-computer interface which one day could, in tandem with a helmet, be used by someone to direct or control vehicles, robots, and other instruments with their thoughts. In addition to an investment in neurotech projects facilitating brain-based communications and operations of various techs, neurotech advancement, including improving or augmenting the brain's capacity to operate in a myriad ways that will assist fighters on the battlefield, Enhancements that claim to improve soldiers' battlefield performance are not new, have previously included illicit drugs, cocaine, and the like. Recent developments in neuroscience have jump-started new possibilities 
with tech and techniques included including DCIs, there's that brain control interface, neuropharmacologies, and or electric currents to stimulate the brain potentially, according to the Small World Wars Journal, improving warfighter performance by enhancing memory, concentration, motivation, and situational awareness while negating the physiological ills of an increased sleep, stress, pain, and traumatic memories. You can just suck those memories right on out, Care Bear, give them to someone else. Um, indeed, augmented cognition has been an area of focus for DARPA, which worked to develop tech capable of exceeding by any order of magnitude the information management capacity of warfighters in the early 2000s. More recently, University of Florida computer science and information researchers in 2022 have received DARPA support to work to augment human cognition by providing task guidance augmented reality headset technology in extreme environments, including high-hazard and risky operations. And similar initiatives to better understand and otherwise enhance the brain and its capacities to take on myriad, especially war-focused tasks, are ongoing. Notably, Spanish researchers developed a human brain-to-brain <coughs> interface in 2014 that allowed humans to communicate with each other by only thinking. The project was funded by the European Commission's Future in Emerging Technology, which is often described as a DARPA equivalent, indicating international interest in developing adjacent technologies. Other such efforts around the globe include the EU-funded Human Brain Project, the China Pro- Brain Project, Japan's Brain Minds Initiative, and Canada's Brain Canada. Dr. Raphael Yust, who I uh, shall discuss in more detail, who helped propose the BRAIN Initiative, is also the coordinator for the International BRAIN Initiative, which coordinates neurotech efforts and policy-making discussions on the subject at the international level. So here you go. Here's the BRAIN Initiative timeline, right? The Obama announces BRAIN Initiative, DARPA commit $100 million in 2014, FDA and DARPA join, $400 million per year funding period, $500 $500 million per year funding period for application of new tools, right? So, you know, fun stuff, right? Look, federal partners. We got the NIH, we got the FDA. All that stuff are involved. So, you know, fun. Um, but anyway, dystopian or not, DARPA and its collaborators and counterparts have been working over the decades to make once unbelievable activities like brain-to-brain and brain-to-machine communication possible if not likely in the years to come, as we will see such technologies impact on the international stage, the battlefield, and daily life alike will be profound if realized. So, ultimately, the advances of emerging DCIs and adjacent tools in the battlefield and the conflict are double-sided, as any advancement made to boost a warfighter's performance can often be applied toward destructive purposes in neural warfare. In other words, the brain is capable of being enhanced as well as attack. In 2024, RAND report speculates if BCA technologies are hacked or compromised, a malicious adversary could potentially inject fear, confusion, or anger into a BCI commander's brain and cause them to make decisions that result in serious harm. That academic Nicolin Evans speculates further that neural implants could control an individual's mental function, perhaps to man- manipulate memories, emotions, even to torture the wearer. Based on those considerations speculations, if DCIs are used en masse at either the warfighter or civilian level, it seems plausible that some attacks could hone on the BCIs of hostile persons, warfighters or otherwise, to manipulate the contents of their mind or even brainwash them in some capacity. Meanwhile, academic Armand Christian even posts that forms of mind control found in nature such as those utilized by gene-manipulating parasites, could eventually be possible. In a 2016 article on neural warfare, he wrote, Microbiologists have recently discovered mind-controlling parasites that can manipulate the behavior of their hosts according to their needs by switching genes on or off. Since human behavior is at least partially influenced by their genetics, non-lethal behavior-modifying genetic bioweapons that spread through a highly contagious virus could thus be, in principle, possible. Christian's observations regarding what's possible are chilling. The realities of Rice University researchers already having hacked into fruit fly brains and commanding their wings via remote control was previously described, perhaps more so. 
While chemical warfare has largely been banned on the international level, gaps in legislation and enforcement leave room for possibilities of different types of chemical attacks or manipulations that target the brain. In this respect, Christian posits that biochemical calmatives and maldurants could incapacitate populations on a mass scale, or oxycontin could otherwise make them docile, subduing them for an enemy benefit. Ultimately, as academics hygiene, Li Junhu and Jing Guo Wang pause it in the Chinese Journal of Traumatology, putting the brain front and center as a military target that can be injured, interfere with, or enhanced could establish a whole new brand, land, sea, space, and sky global combat mode. As I will show this emerging brain, land, sea, space, and sky global combat mode appears poised to change how conflicts between nation states are realized and fought entirely. As the world endures major wars in Ukraine and now the Middle East, with Israel's ongoing destruction of Gaza, neuro warfare is also on the horizon. Indeed, the technologies outlined in the previous section appear slated to transform geopolitical relations as both hard and soft power tools which could then be used to manipulate populations, lifestyles, worldviews, and even cognitive abilities to make them viable to someone else's will. Of course, various soft power tactics have long worked to influence the mind, political allegiances, and socioeconomic realities of civilians in hostile territories. The U.S., for example, has often extensive propaganda campaigns as part of its color revolutionary efforts for regime change in countries and governments deemed inconvenient to American geopolitical goals. Yet neuro weapons, if used on a broad scale, seem positioned to take things to another level. Georgetown University Neurology and Biochemistry Professor and Director of the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies, Dr. James Giordano, explains in a 2020 article entitled Redefining Neuroweapons, Emerging Capabilities in Neuroscience and Neurotech. Neuro-based advancements could theoretically be used to exercise social economic power elsewhere or otherwise disrupt societies in ways that do not involve explicit military action. Shockingly, he mentions that these disruptions could theoretically be done through the denigration of hostile groups, cognitive, or emotional states. Indeed, neurotech can be employed as both soft and hard weapons in competition with adversaries. In the form of sense, neurotech research and development can be utilized to exercise social economic power and global markets, while in the latter sense, neurotech can be employed to augment friendly forces' capabilities and to denigrate cognitive emotive and or behavioral abilities of hostile, right? So, mm -hmm. as Giordano elaborates in another article, the destructive capabilities of neuroweaponry make them especially valuable in non-kinetic engagements because they can put the perpetrators at a strategic advantage for kinetic response to non-kinetic neuroweaponry, neuro however profound, may appear to aggressive. In this context, kinetic engagements can be best described as overt or hot military engagements, were active and sometimes lethal <coughs> forces used. Um, conversely, non-kinetic engagements refer to more covert strategies and activities to counter an enemy, including within the diplomatic, digital, economic, and perhaps now the neurosphere. Giordano goes on to say that in a recipient of neuro warfare does not sufficiently respond to attack, the neuro weapon's disruptive influence and its possible strategically destructive effects become increasingly manifest. In other words, neural warfare is in position to drive nation-states geopolitical strategies on how geopolitical tensions fester or explode in the future. As Giordano has implied via his reference to socio-economic power, it appears non-kinetic neural warfare seems likely to impact not only soldiers and military outcome, but also civilians and the societies they live in, especially as states initiate hostility. As a 2020 NATO-sponsored study in why cognitive warfare matters, future conflicts will likely occur amongst the people digitally first and physically thereafter in proximity to hubs of political and economic power. We've seen that before. Namely, as Christian notes in a 2016 article, it seems possible that neural warfare could even manipulate political leaders and populations to suppress their free will enabling perpetrators to assert their political will on entire populations without resorting to kinetic responses. Here, a variety of tools, especially those described earlier, could be used in tandem to disorient, placate, or devastate the masses on a large scale. 
Christian writes, in a defensive function, neural warfare may, may use to suppress conflicts before they can break out. Occupied populations could be more easily pacified. Palmatives could be put in the drinking water, where populations could be sprayed with oxytocin to make them more trusting. Potential terrorists may be detected using brain scans and then chemically or otherwise neutered. <coughs> this obviously creates the possibility of creating a system of high-tech repression, where in the words of writer Aldous Huxley, a method of control could be established by which a people can be made to enjoy a state of affairs by which any decent standard they ought not to enjoy. Like the Matrix. Um, as Christian Mintz is aptly bringing Aldous Huxley's Brave New World prescription for the future in the conversation, current circumstances have set the stage possible manipulation and top-down high-tech repression at all levels, making it difficult for those experiencing it to even understand their previous freedoms have been stripped from them. Indeed, Christian explains that neuro warfare could transform hostile societies, cultures, and values, even collapse them based on the motion through technology could induce. Offensive neuro warfare would be aimed at manipulating the political in social situation in another state, it could have social values, culture, popular beliefs, and collective behaviors of change or political directions, for example, by way of regime change through democratizing other societies. However, offensive neuro warfare could also mean collapsing adversarial states by creating conditions of lawlessness, insurrection, and revolution. For example, by adducing fear, confusion, or anger, Adversarial states could be destabilized using advanced technologies of diversion, sabotage, environmental modification, and gray terrorism, followed by a direct military attack. As a result, the adversarial state would not have the capacity to resist the policies of a covert aggressor. Ultimately, as per the circumstances described by defense and neuroscience tech, analysts and academics in space, neural weapons could become an unprecedented new driver of soft power minds are a target of influence in ways that were previously unimaginable, subsequently in kinetic exchanges, minds could become targets to denigrate or destroy in the world of neural warfare. However, increasingly, as it seems that the line between kinetic and non-kinetic is becoming blurred, as war moves to target not just physical reality, but humans' internal reality through the brain. As emerging neurotech increasingly jeopardize the mind's sanctity in the outside of wartime conditions, some are calling for the protection of the brain through neural rights. Groups like Columbia University's Neural Rights Foundation, whose stated goal is to protect the human rights of all people from the traditional misuse or abuse of neurotechnology, have sprouted to advocate for the matter, and neural rights policy discussions are ongoing in high places like the EU, and the United Nations Human Rights Council, Chile, meanwhile, has been praised by groups like UNESCO for its legislative efforts in the area, which has included adding brain-related rights to the country's constitution. No rights have been de depicted in the media as protections that ensure emerging neurotechs are only used for altruistic purposes. However, a closer look at neural rights initiatives and adjacent legislation suggests many of these pushing for neural rights are in fact facilitating the emerging tax normalization within the consumer market and everyday life through the creation of legislative frameworks. This opens up possibilities for what unlimited hangout contributing editor Whitney Webb described as neuro markets. Indeed, those backing neuro rights efforts deserve scrutiny for their close proximity to the very defense industry and adjacent institutions proliferating the controversial neurotech we've described earlier. For instance, Dr. Raphael Yust, who heads Columbia University of Neural Rights Foundation and University Cavalry Institute, helped pitch the now heavily DARPA influenced and funded brain initiative in the U.S. government. He is also the coordinator of the brain initiative, 650 international centers, and participated in projects like those I outlined in this article earlier. Through research in genetic engineering on mice, for example, Dr. Yust has helped pioneer technology that can read and write to the brain with unprecedented precision, where he can even make the mice see things that aren't there. Despite the use proximity of the very orgs researching and promoting questionable neurotechs, right, he's one of the primary actors behind Chile's neural rights legislation. Indeed, the legislation appears less revolutionary within the context of Chile's legacy as a testing ground for neoliberal policy-making efforts created abroad. <coughs> What's more, legal scholars have argued Neural rights, as proposed, are inherently flawed from a legal standpoint. 
and Jan Kristoff's public writing that the neural right proposal is tainted by neuroexceptionalism and neuroessentialism and lacks grounding in relevant scholarship. Alejandro Seniga Fafuri, Luis Villan Ben Villa Vic Inicio, Miranda, Daniel Zaro Morales, and Ricardo Salas Venegas argue that the neuro rights concept is legally redundant and is based on an out outdated Cartesian reductionist philosophy thesis, which advocates the need to create new rights in order to shield a specific part of the human body, the brain. Whenever the legal system is fact and is debatable, still it's odd that neuro rights legislative proposals are being pushed around the world, despite being apparently unable to withstand scrutiny from the scholars. Indeed, neuro rights legislation is under construction in a number of countries, especially in Latin America, apparently in a manner represented by many recent top down global policy initiatives that have come to pass in previous years, right? Like the coronavirus one. In any case, neurotexts like BCIs and the normalization of the consumer level could pose a myriad of ethical problems. For example, DARPA's augmented cognition efforts to soup up warfighters' brains are described earlier in the article. It brought to the consumer market could quickly wreak havoc and perhaps even create cognitive inequities, if inaccessible to most. As Dr. Youth himself told the New York Times, certain groups will get this tech and will enhance themselves. This is a really serious threat to humanity. That's the New York Times saying that. To address this alleged problem of accessibility, one of the neural rights proposals crafted by Youth in the Morningside group, a group of scientists which, after being called together by use, has worked to identify priorities they consider neural rights is the right to fair access to mental augmentation. But it's not hard to imagine neural rights legislation is facilitating a number of dystopian scenarios. The very availability of such tech be well put economic or social pressure. Uh, where, where, where are they at? Social pressure? Such tech may social pressure on the general population to receive or use it, perhaps in the form of state subsidized PCIs, even state mandated PCIs for some professions or groups of people. What does that sound like, Colin? Didn't you have. You had to have stuff mandated to you, right? Um, mm hmm. So even those in wealthier countries could cognitively augment themselves in ways unavailable in poor countries. It seems unlikely, after all, that truly equal access to cognitive occupation could be facilitated internationally, bringing in new, untold advantages with global geopolitical impacts. In any case, it's curious that equitable access to cognitive augmentation is being legislated upon through neural rights initiatives without substantive debate as to whether such augmentation should be allowed in the first place or is even safe. Ultimately, rather than protect people from the possible ethical harms of emerging neurotech, neural rights legislation ultimately appears poised, normalized, and facilitate the arrival of the brain chips and other advanced and often dystopian neurotechs discussed in the investigation into daily life. Although ongoing strikes to enhance and in turn degrade and destroy warfighter capabilities on the battlefield through tools like DCIs and other implantables, neuropharmacolo neuropharmacologies, these and efforts to augment cognition may well transform the nation of warfare, kinetic or otherwise, as militaries put the brain front and center in conflict. How does a way to sidestep the possible ramifications of these technologies, neural rights which have been proposed by persons closely affiliated with the orgs creating the tech in the first place, ultimately appears to be about normalizing the tech and introducing it and integrating it within the public sphere. So, I think I'm going to pause there. Um, and let people go finish that article because I think it's just closing up. So, um, thoughts, Care Bear? Lots to take in. Um, yeah. Um, um but again, it's, I will admit this. Well, let me ask you this, because hmm. you, you had, you wanted to talk about this. Yeah. Why? Well, I, I think part of it is, is that I, I think we're already seeing a lot of this information war, right? And people don't know why or how it's working, right? You know, uh, Whitney Webb talked about this extensively with 
the digital front, right, and how they're manipulating that. But um, there's a, a Star Trek episode in, I think, New Space Nine, right, where one of the characters <laughs> is found out to have had genetic, uh, like, enhancements, right? Mm-hmm. But that that but that was illegal in the Federation, right? To do because it essentially puts you above someone else, right? It's essentially performance enhancing drugs for life, right? So I think with these brain chips, they they talked about that, right? Where there's going to be essentially that will be by can you afford them or not, right? So someone could theoretically just think better, than you, you know, it, with a brain chip. Or vice versa, you know. So that's part of this too. So uh, you know, and I definitely think you're going to start seeing that on the battlefield for sure. So, and be careful. I'm also with, just kind of wondering what yeah. our audience like. Why do you th- why did you think it was important for them to at least know about this? Well, I think for stuff like mandates and things like that, you know, to be leery of of some of this coming down the road. You know, so especially as we're going to start to see legislation, I'm sure, you know, but that's why I brought it. So, but, you know, this is talking about things, this is why we're demonetized. So, you can always go to codashv.com slash TV News Network, give us a little donation there, scan the QR code on your screen, put exclamation mark donate in chat. Leave us a little super chat. Um, but if you can't do that, just like and subscribe. Do the easy things to do. Share, comment, you know, give us a little bit of engagement. We so thankfully need. But anyway, um, I have one more story to go through and then we're out of here. So it's short. Um, but I'm going to go check Rock and Rumble before I do that. Um, you can make people see others as literal roaches, says Anna Mayers on the Rockfin. I did like how one of them was called Moana. That was like the memory to memory thing. Mm. Right? I mean, that's, that to me is crazy. The possibilities is wild to me, you know? Um, Ghost Art says on the Rumble, it gives a chip off the old block a whole new meaning. So. You know, this is brain seeding. It's it's vanilla sky. It's like every dystopian sci-fi ever, in my opinion. That is, they're more than willing to go down the road of. So, and like with any technology, it's one of those things where both capitalism and you know the military are going to corrupt it. So, yeah, isn't that nice? Isn't it a nice place we live, Colin? <sighs> oh. Well, you ready for our last one? Mm. Mm-hmm. I'm ready. So, um, I have to scroll all the way down here. But, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about Space Wars. <laughs> and he says he can hear my Discord, so therefore he's going to send something to my Discord for people to hear, because that works. It's actually Colin's Discord, sir. Um, that I can hear. Um, but anyway, all right. Space Force. Hold on. Two, one, cool. Um, so, you're probably wondering what that means. Um, yeah, now, thank you. Anyway, not enough war on the ground. The U.S. is taking it to space, Colin. We get to go and have war in space. Isn't that nice? Isn't that what we all wanted? Um, The military-industrial complex is suiting up for a new arms race, right? This is again from Struggle with Paps, this time over at Responsible Statecraft, right? She's putting this out through SharePost. So, Elon Musk again, space company SpaceX, recently secured a classified contract to build an extensive network of spy satellites for an undisclosed U.S. intelligence agency, with one source telling Reuters that no one can hide under the perspective network's reach. 
While the deal suggests the space company, which currently operates over half the active satellites orbiting Earth, has warned to warn the U.S. national security, security agency. It's not the first Washington investment in conflict for space machinery. Rather, the U.S. is funding or otherwise supporting a range of defense contractors and startups working to create a new generation of space-bound weapons, surveillance systems, and adjacent technologies. In other words, America is hell-bent on a new arms race in space. In space. I'm <coughs> escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space. So, attempts to regulate weapons presence and use in space spend decades, responding to an intense Cold War era arms race between the U.S. and Soviet Union, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty established that space, while free for all countries to explore and use, was limited to peaceful endeavors. Almost 60 years later, the Outer Space Treaty's vague language regarding military limitations in space, as a space policy expert, Michelle L.D. Hanlon and Greg Autry highlight, leave more than enough room for interpretation to result in conflict. Ugh. So, stonewalling subsequent international efforts to limit the militari militarization of space through the U.S. is participating in a new U.N. working group on the subject. Washington's interest in space exploration and adjacent weapons technology also goes back decades. Many may recall President Reagan's 1983 Strategic Defense <laughs> Initiative. Remember that one, right? which was established to develop land, air, and space-based missile defense systems to deter missile or nuclear weapons against the U.S., cynically referred to by critics as the Star Wars program. Many SDNI initiatives are ultimately canned due to prohibitive costs and technological limitations. And while the Pentagon established Space Command in 1985, the Space Force, an entirely new branch of the military focused solely on pursuing superiority in the space domain, was launched in 2019, signaling renewed emphasis on space militarization as U.S. policy. Long-term American interest in space war tech now manifests in ambitious projects where defense companies and startups are lining up for military contracts to create a new generation of space weaponry and adjacent tech, including space vehicles, hypersonic rockets, and extensive surveillance and communications projects. For starters, Space Force's Space Development Agency recently granted defense contractors L3 Harris and Lockheed Martin and space company Sierra Space contracts worth $2.5 billion to build satellites for the U.S. military's proliferated warfighter space architecture, a constellation of hundreds of satellites built out on tranches that provide various warfighting capabilities, including the collection and transmission of critical wartime communications into low Earth orbit. The PWSA will serve as the backbone of the Pentagon's Joint All Domain Command and Control Project, an effort to bolster warfighting capacities and decision making process by facilitating information advantage at the speed of relevance. Other efforts are just as sci fi esque. Zoning in on hypersonic weapon systems and parts, for example, RTX, formerly Raytheon, and North of Grumman have collaborated to secure a DARPA contract for a hypersonic air breathing weapons concept. Colin, why does that thing need to breathe air? You riddle me that. <coughs> like. I don't need no hypersonic nothing air breathing. I'm just saying. So, where scramjet powered missiles can travel at hypersonic speeds for offensive purposes. And aerospace startup True Anomaly, which is funded by military officers and receives funding from the U.S. Space Force to the tune of over $17 million, is developing space we weapons and adjacent conflict for tools. An example is True Anomaly's Jackal Autonomous Orbit Vehicle, an imaging satellite able to take on, according to True Anomaly CEO Evan Rogers, rendezvous and proximity operations missions with uncooperative targets. 
As True Anomaly finds fiscal success, accruing over $100 million in December, Series B's fundraising round from venture capitalists, including Clips Ventures and Acme Capital, other aerospace startups are funding the market with the assistance of the U.S. government, both in funding and other critical partnerships. Take out Firehawk Aerospace, which wants to create the rocket system of the future to enable the next generation in 2021 test rocket engine at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. It recently secured Army Applications Laboratory Buford U.S. Air Force Small Business Innovation Research Award to advance developments in its rocket motors and engines. Data and satellite-focused American space tech company Capella Space, a contractor for federal agencies, including the Air and Space Forces, specializes in reconnaissance, powerful surveillance tools, including geospatial intelligence, and synthetic aperture radar, monitoring to help national security officials identify a myriad of security risks. In early 2023, Capella Space even formed a subsidiary, Capella Federal, to provide federal clients with additional access the Synthetic Aperture Radar Imaging Services. The funding of expensive future space surveillance and weapon projects indicates the U.S.'s eagerness to maintain superiority. For military personnel, positive such advancements are critical within the context of both a space race and an increasingly tumultuous geopolitical climate. It's not the possibility of war in space outright. As Space Force General Chase Saltzman declared at the recent Mitchell Institute Space Power Security Forum, if we do not have space, we lose testifying before the Senate Armed Services Committee in late February. Space Force General Stephen N. Biden explained the U.S. Space Command must alter its military capacities through increased personnel training and investments in relevant technologies that the U.S. is ready if deterrence <coughs> While well, upping its own military capacities, however, Washington is simultaneously pushing against other countries anti-satellite weapons testing and capa- uh, capability the U.S. already has. What's more, the U.S. recently accused Russia of developing possibly nuclear anti-satellite weaponry in violation of the Outer Space Treaty. But the accusations, which Russia denies, are vague, and as Todd Harrison the Center for Strategic Budgetary Assessments, and Clayton Swope for the Center for Strategic and International Studies posit Russia's use of such a weapon seems unlikely as it is effectively a kamikaze attack and would likely take out many of Russia's own satellites will prompt a to retaliation from adversaries. In any case, such pointing fingers when coupled with ongoing space deterrence and weapon proliferation efforts does little to advance genuine diplomacy, where states could instead discuss on equal terms how space should be used and shared amongst nations. Ultimately, weapons and aerospace company efforts have launched a new generation of weaponry and adjacent tech, buoyed by consistent support from the deterrence-focused U.S. As a result, the military-industrial complex has further, further expanded it to the domain of space, where defense companies have new opportunities to score lucrative weapon contracts and theoretically even push for more conflict. Thoughts, Care Bear? Ugh. My uh, room on the Earth, so. Yep. Yeah, in space. Yay! Space! Fun. <laughs> so. Yeah, space nukes, space, just the worst sci fi terror Armageddon imaginable. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my story. So. You know, hope people learn some stuff. Um, you know, you can always choose to support us over at codashv.com slash indie news networks in the QR code on the screen. Or put exclamation mark donate in chat. You can super chat with us. Um, or you can just like and subscribe. Very easy. Make sure to leave a comment. You know, tell us what you think. Tell us what you think will happen. Help us get to do K. What, what are we at now, K Bear? Uh, we gain any? With we still at eighteen ninety eight. Cool, eighteen ninety eight. Two people. You got to get two people to go sub. That's what you got to get. That's that's your job for tonight, chat. Go go send that to two new people. Um, but yeah, 
Anything else you wanted to add before we head out of here? I'm tired. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Me too. All right. <clears throat> well, what do we got and, next week? And, and on the frets. So, um, in the Eastern, so he can help us. Uh, tomorrow, possibly politically homeless. I haven't heard anything. Um, Friday, Tara. On. Yes, should have Fiorello. Okay. So, so Amy was a guest on um, MC Squared. I'm sure he's going to send me all the stuff in Discord. So, uh, Friday night, Angel. Uh, yeah. at seven. Uh, Saturday. Angel playing. Is that eight or eight? I think it's at eight. Is that eight for you? Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then I guess Himbo streaming, uh, gaming stream at eleven thirty, more than likely. Yeah. Um, Sunday, you and Indy for how do we miss that at ten thirty? Yep. Saturday, go um, check out Beauty and the Boomer. They do stuff every night over there. So. Go check them um, out. Monday. Uh, Monday. Trying to think. I think we might have something lined mm -hmm. up, but we'll see. Um. So. But yeah. Tuesday. American Tuesday, tradition. American tradition with, with Jesse and Amy. And then we're back here next week. Oh, speaking of Jesse. Yeah. Um. How are we doing with his fundraiser? Forty six percent. Can you believe? Almost half. Yeah. So. Yep. Uh, that? So yeah. Uh, if Jesse. you're able to help out, uh, so Jesse can get a new computer so he can stream, but then also produce new music. Please help him out. Uh, yep. Also, I know Indy has talked about this extensively, but he will be performing with Due Dissonance in New York on June 9th. Sure. Um, we should probably have a link somewhere at some point, but we'll probably do that, I guess, starting next week. Yep. Um, so, in the New York area, New York City area, uh, definitely check out that show. But I think I want to know how to show this. It'll be a 2 p.m. and a 7 p.m. show. Uh, I think it will also feature Jose Vega, Tusker, and uh, that have yet to be confirmed. Um, so tickets, I believe, are around 30 bucks. I'm sure they'll so run out quick. If you're in the, if, yeah, so if you're in the area, if you want to, uh, uh, see Jesse live and obviously see do this and send over uh, check them out um, we'll we'll send links or if you can go if you go to do just in this channel I'm sure that also will have some information but I think we probably should feature that at least in upcoming weeks to kind of prepare for that so yeah um, and then Indy let me know less from missing he hasn't Actually. so far. So. Uh, cool. Um, I think that's it. Can uh, always get some oh, merch? Sunday. Yeah. Sunday, Misty might be uh, doing a doing show. Doing a show. On I remember. Channel. Yeah. Um, so go so, check out at Sarcasm Stardust on Twitter. Find, find that. Should be able to get info on how to join that. So, but as long as there's nothing else, I think that's it. So, you know, <coughs> mm -hmm. but yeah, anything you want to tell people before we head out? That's it. Well, as always, kids, labels are bad. Stay in the pen. Good night, fam. Have a good week, everyone. We want to talk right down to earth. In a language that everybody here can easily understand. Easily understand. Easily understand. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.